Good evening, friends. I am Dr. Vinita Ramnani, Secretary, Bhopal Divisional Ophthalmic Society. Welcome you all on this webinar of Neuro Ophthalmology. This webinar started by our doctor, analyst, Dr. Pohit Saksena from uh, RP Center, Dr. Ankur Sinha from uh, Jaipur. Dr. Ajit Verma, a senior neurologist from Bansal Hospital, Dr. Neeraj Rai from Ames. We will be having keynote address by Dr. Rohit Saxena, followed by our uh, talks. And then lastly, the case presentation by our uh, <coughs> clinical secretary, Dr. Chahavi Timbra. Now I invite our uh, president, Dr. Lalit Srivastava sir, to give official welcome address and introduced our panelist. Okay. Thank you, Vinita. Over to you, Dr. Thank Dalit. you, Vinita. Good evening to everybody. Are you listening to me? Yes, yeah. sir. Yeah, you are. So, I welcome to you all on the VIP of the Bhopal Divisional Ophthalmic Society for this very good uh, webinar on neuroophthalmology today. So I welcome to our panelist, Professor Rohit Saxena. <coughs> He's a professor at our Institute of Medical Sciences, RP Center, New Delhi. He did his graduation, post-graduation and PhD from RP Center, Ames, uh, Delhi. He has got 260 publications which are indexed and 180 is unindexed publications. And he's a thesis guide of so many MS students at about 42. He's the editor of two books and authored 50 chapters in various national and international books on his squint and neuro ophthalmology. He has invited a speaker at numerous national conferences and CME meets, performed life spent surgery in national and state level conferences, regularly conducting instruction courses at uh, All Industry Ophthalmic Society and international conferences in squint and neuro ophthalmology. Conferred with more than 32 national and international awards. <laughs> He is the past secretary of Divisional uh, Delhi Ophthalmic Society, editor Delhi Ophthalmic Society Times, Delhi General of Ophthalmology, reviewed for 12 international index generals and member editorial and advisory board for three international index generals. The name of the circle is that we are showing you the same way. He is a very eminent Afternoon of the nation of international repute. I welcome you, sir, with the core of my heart in this webinar. Next is Dr. Ankur Sinha. He's a glaucoma and squint and neuro specialist. He's a director of Max Vision IK Center, Jaipur. He did his MS and senior residency from RP Center, Ames, New Delhi. He's a, he was a treasurer. Indian Pediatric Glaucoma Society and SPOSI, Executive Member Indian Neuro Ophthalmology Society and Rajasthan Ophthalmology Society. He 20 indexed publications and 40 oral and poster presentation done by him. Over 250 presentation and participant participations as faculty in various national, international and state conferences. I also welcome you, sir, Dr. Sena. Next, next, Dr. Ajit Verma. Uh, yeah, sir, you, can go, you can uh, go fast. <laughs> uh, sir, I am going very fast. He is a pioneer in neuro neurology. As a very good neurophysician of this capital, Madhya Pradesh, Bhopal, fellow at Institute of Neurology, National Hospital for Neurology and Neurosurgery, Queen Square, London. It is a visiting fellow Ludwig Max Williams University, Munich, Germany, clinical fellow Newcastle University, England, formerly assistant professor at Gardi Medical College, Ujjain. He published international and national papers, research and review articles, a special interest in headache, dizziness, and stroke rehabilitation. Invited speaker in VMJ master classes. I invite you, sir, in this webinar, sir. Next is Dr. Narendra Rai. 
very known figure in this field at Ames Bhopal, additional professor and head department of neurology, All Institute of Medical Sciences, Bhopal. He did his MBBS and MD for Banaras Hindu University, Banarasi. He did his DM from Ames, New Delhi, fellowship intervention neuro radiology, University Hospital, Zurich. 20 research papers published in index journals, three chapters in textbooks, member of the various national and international academic bodies, is a member of expert committee, new drug divisional, central drugs, standard control mission, DGCI government. I welcome you, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you, President, sir, for... Uh, and and I also yeah. welcome to Dr. Preeti Singh, Dr. Nitin Garg, Dr. Pratik Sharma, our senior and my uh, my class fellow, Dr. Sunil Pandit, Dr. Vivek Som, uh, Dr. Ganesh Pillay, Abhachi Patan, Dr. Salil Kumar Saab, Professor Dr. Kavita, Dr. Bhavna, and all the audiences, those who are attending this webinar, prepared by our team, especially Dr. Uh, Vinita Ramnani, Dr. Javid, Dr. Ganesh, I all, I welcome to all you in this webinar. Thank you. Thank you, Madam. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Thank you for your kind words, sir. Uh, now I will do the honors for introducing our uh, speakers. Uh, they are always ready to present Dr. Preeti Singh. She is um, Presently, assistant professor at Gandhi Medical College, and she worked before at Allen Medical College, and she has 15 research publications, and she is a co-guide to many cases, and she is a comprehensive anterior segment surgeon. I also welcome um, you, Dr. Preeti. <laughs> Very most welcome. Preeti Sharma, he is a DM Neurology Senior Consultant. Chief of Stroke Unit at Bansal Hospital. He was uh, associate assistant professor at BMHRC before. He has a special interest in the stroke and pediatric neurology. He has established the stroke unit first time in city and has done more than 50 intravenous thrombolysis stroke. We welcome you, sir, Dr. Pratiksha. Welcome you, sir. Welcome you, sir. Thank you. Welcome. Dr. Ganesh Pillay is uh, MD from AIMS, New Delhi and worked as an resident there. Now he is a medical director and consultant at ASGI Hospital Bhopal. He works for Retina, Catrick, UVI and ROP and has more than 15 publications. We welcome you Dr. Ganesh. Dr. Sunil Pandit is a well-known neurosurgeon. Uh, he is an MCH neurosurgery from Sri Chitra. And he's a director at President Swami Vivekanand Institute of Neurology at Bhopal in, from 2005. He has an experience of more than 25 years and he has a special interest in neuro-ophthalmology. Vivek Som is a professor at Gandhi Medical College. He has done all his uh, MBBS and uh, he has done his MBBS and um, from Indore and MS from TMC Bhopal and he is working in our Regina Speciality Unit also. Welcome Dr. Vivek. Dr. Nitin Garg is, Welcome, Dr. Dr. Nitin Nitin. Garg is MS, MRCS, MCH Neurosurgery. He is a consultant neurosurgeon and minimally invasive spine surgeon at Bansal Hospital. He is a director very and he has performed a long list of 7,000 neurological uh, procedures. Uh, he is a very humble and very um, good surgeon. He has performed the first case of phrenic nerve stimulation in India. We invite you, sir. He has lot Welcome many publications and a uh, very uh, well written chapter in the book. Thank you. Thank you. And Welcome then last Dr. is Dr. Chavi Singh Bindra. Uh, he is uh, MBBS from KM, MS from Bhopal, and he is uh, working as a retina consultant at Matashri Hospital and he's in the Ophthalmic Society. Welcome, so Dr. With Chavi. This, I thank you all. And now we officially start our uh, webinar. And uh, I'm very pleased to invite Dr. 
Rohit Saxena sir for his keynote address on a neuro ophthalmological cases I can't afford to miss. Dr. Rohit Saxena sir please. Thank you Dr. Vinita. Uh, at the very beginning I wish to thank uh, Bhopal Divisional Economic Society uh, Dr. Shivastav and Dr. Vinita for the opportunity. Uh, it is wonderful that uh, this is a combined meeting with the uh, uh, leading neurologists, because we are able to share uh, a lot of ideas which otherwise remain locked uh, between us only. So, looking forward to a, a wonderful discussion. I just start uh, my talk. Uh, neuro ophthalmology cases you can't miss. Actually, in ophthalmology, I, you can't miss anything. In neuro ophthalmology, again, more so, it becomes very important because not only are you having a risk of uh, sight but you also have a risk of life. So it becomes very important, particularly in certain cases. So I'll run through a few of the cases we've been seeing where I feel the few subtle points may help us uh, to pick up and to have a basic understanding of what we must look at. So this was uh, a 26-year-old female who presented to us with on and off headaches, progressive diminution for two years. On examination, her vision was 6 by 18 in the right eye and 636 in the left. And it was a mild temporal pallor both eyes. Now, this was her appearance on direct questioning. She gave us a history that she has amenorrhea and coarsening of facial features and hands for some time now. So the first test in neuroophthalmology really that we should really do is confrontation fields or fee I mean confrontation of course and map field. So I'm showing you a Goldman fields, not so commonly done now, but uh, they help us to understand the field effect very clearly. So when we place the fields, the right field in front of the right eye and the left field in front of our left eye, you can very clearly make out in this that there's a developing superior quadrant in Ophia. So both sides superior temporal areas are gone. The moment you see something like this, it becomes essential that you do a neuroimaging. And this patient had a large pituitary tumor. Another patient, this was in fact a medical doctor in Ames only, a 65-year-old uh, gentleman who came to us with a difficulty in near vision. That's what he was actually telling us. He had repeatedly been refracted, but he was just not satisfied with these repeated refractions and corrections for near he was getting. Uh, we asked him to read just his near vision and it, we realized he was repeatedly moving his heads and having a little abnormal head posture and the fundi revealed mild temporal pallor. Again, the key thing to do is a confrontation fields. And in this, you can see, again, a very clear bitemporal complete hemianopias. So again, the key investigation, whenever you suspect our fields, so visual functions completely must be looked at in any neuroophthalmology case. Visual acuity is not enough. Visual functions would include visual acuity, color, contrast, visual fields, and stereopsis. And again, neuroimaging was advised, and this gentleman also had a large pituitary adenoma. In fact, being a physician, he had missed out on certain signs, which were pretty signposts for pituitary tumors. A 24-year-old male presented to us with diminution of vision, right eye three weeks, left eye two, week, two days. He had a history of numbness of the extremities. Vision was subnormal, 624 and 612. A right eye had a mild relative afternoon pituitary defect. These were the fields, rest, everything was unremarkable. Again, the visual fields showed a little odd-looking field effect. Uh, possible diagnosis was bilateral retrobulbar neuritis. IV methylprednisolone was given. He improved. You can see the vision improved in both eyes. The fields almost cleared. Now, of course, uh, optic neuritis will be dis uh, discussed. And now we actually advise that any patient who suspect optic neuritis should be uh, imaged. But in view of atypical feature, it becomes extremely important. Bilaterality in this case, delayed recovery of vision. He had a three-week history already of vision loss, so it was not recovering. Incomplete recovery of vision, bilateral temporal pallor. So again, neuroimaging was essential. He also had a, a pituitinoma. So essentially, what we cannot miss is a space occupying lesion, and we must be very sensitive. There's some clinical features that can be indicative are significant headaches, transient visual obscurations, field loss, defects, bilateral temporal pallor on the pondus, nerve palsies, 
neurological and sim systemic symptoms which often the patient does not tell an ophthalmologist because he feels he may i mean there is no need for the ophthalmologist to know and any sudden diminution of vision also can be a presentation feature of a space of condition now this was a case of ptosis 24 year old female limitation of ocular movements drooping of the upper lid and diminution of diminished right eye vision was finger counting close to face so you had on examination ptosis and reduced corneal sensation. So the key thing you're looking at is localizing the lesion in this case. So you can see that there is limitation of ocular motility, the medial rectus, the lateral rectus, elevation, depression, and of course, a temporal pallor, which is pretty significant. So we have found a second, third, fourth, fifth, and sixth cranial nerve palsy. And these all together are constituting the orbital apex syndrome because that's the only place where all these nerves come together. There was a, on exam, on evaluation on MRI, there was a ring enhancing lesion on the superior rectus, which appeared to be a cysticercosis, and that was our diagnosis. The patient was treated with albendazole and penicillone for six weeks, and you can see the significant improvement. Uh, the vision did not improve that significantly, but her motility was completely restored. Another case of ptosis, we have this 10-year-old girl with drooping li lids and pain on eye movements. You can see the significant droop and very subtle superior rectus underaction. So otherwise, gross motility is fine, but you need to see, you can see a slight superior rectus underaction. The patient, of course, did not be able to here because of the ptosis. Again, localizing to the orbital apex, another case of a cysticercosis involving the superior rectus LPS in the left eye. And again, post albendazole, she was very good. The key message in these kind of cases is we must localize the lesion. The moment you have polyneuropathy or a set of signs involving multiple sites or multiple areas of the body, you should be able to localize the lesion, advise the imaging, and uh, to the radiologist so that a proper diagnosis can be made. In this patient, if an MRI or a CT brain was done, there was a possibility that the that we would have missed the lesion. So key thing is localize the lesion. We have another ptosis movement limitation, 50-year-old female with sudden dip onset diplopia, vision good, both eyes. So you just have ptosis with ocular motility limitation. So with a pupil involvement, so this was a left pupillary involving third nerve. Now, a mononeuropathy is what we are looking at. It's essential to rule out a mass or a space occupying lesion in these conditions, especially cranial nerve palsies. The indications for imaging would be in a young patient, in an older patient with third nerve, with pupillary invo involvement, aberrant regeneration without history of trauma, and increase in symptoms over signs. So if pupil is involved, and imaging is mandatory if it is spared and there is complete third nerve palsy, extra ocular motility palsy, you can follow up, do medical in examination and manage the medical symptoms. But if there is partial ophthalmoplegia or a partial third nerve palsy, again, imaging is required because it may be part of an evolving third nerve palsy. And this patient, the MRI showed a suspicion of an aneurysm, which was confirmed on an MR angiography. This was a case of bilateral ptosis, a 35-year-old male with bilateral recent onset droop. Everything else normal. You can see the ocular motility limitation on all directions. Always in bilateral involvement, even in unilateral involvement, especially ptosis, always ask for history of diagonal variations, which is positive in this patient. We did a neostigmine test, and you can see the post-neostigmine, the ptosis is corrected, and the ocular motility is, fair, is full. If you cannot localize the lesion, think myasthenia. That is the key message for myasthenia. Myasthenia is a big mimicker and can manifest in many ways. A sudden onset loss of vision in a 76-year-old male, bilateral vision loss, very recent onset, history of hypertension, and the key history he gave was jaw claudication, scalp pain on combing, headaches, and muscle pain. These are very important history in an elderly male presenting with sudden loss. On fundus, you can see chalky white swelling of the disc with, in the right eye, associated focal retinal edema. The key investigations to do in these patients would be an ESR and CRT, which was significantly elevated. This was a patient of arthritic ischemic optic neuropathy to be differentiated from a non-arthritic ischemic optic neuropathy, which usually will present unilateral initially 
the pallo would be less, there would be moderate edema, the visual loss would be less, the patients are much younger. So this is the key difference, of course, between ischemic and arthritic and non-arthritic ischemic optic neuropathy. In the non-arthritic variety, we look at systemic problems and manage them. In the systemic, in the arthritic patients, you need to urgently and rapidly treat with steroids. Otherwise, both eyes vision loss becomes severe and complete. And there is, of course, a supply in these patients. Patient presents with headache. Look at the fundus. This was referred as papilledema, but the moment you look, you must realize all even subtle discovered edema is not papilledema. This is a pa patient of grade four hypertension resulting in all these features. Compare this with the patient of papilledema. You can see whatever retinal findings are there are associated with this. Here, a lot of these hard exudates, soft exudates, hemorrhages are far removed from the disc where the disc edema is also very minimal. So differentiate papilledema from other presentations. And finally, this is the last case, a case of toxicity, or was it actually? A patient came to us with gradual progressive painless diminution of vision in both eyes for about one and a half months. He was treated for TB meningitis for one and a half years, currently having very significant visual loss, right more than left to the right RATD. The fundus showed disc pallor. So clear CTR diagnosis would have been a toxic optic neuropathy due to thambutol. Now that would be the most obvious diagnosis and one I would have, I also made. But on asking, we realized that the patient was not on ethambutol for the last five months and not even on isomiazid, which is the other associated occasional drug for toxic optic neuropathy for three months. The visual evoke was significantly affected, and this is the perimetry. The right eye had poor vision, and the left eye, you can see, again, temporal field loss in the left eye. Imaging becomes mandatory. The patient had ring uh, shape lesion, suggestive of tuberculoma, just above the chiasma which was responsible for the visual loss. So this was a patient of compressive neuropathy, secondary to tuberculomas compressing on the optic chiasma. Again, important message is tuberculosis-related vision loss is just not toxic optic neuropathy. In TB meningitis, there could be direct infection and toxicity. TB meningitis is causing hydrocephalus with secondary optic atrophies and tuberculomas anywhere in the visual pathway. They require a completely different management compared to with ambitol toxicity. Therefore, it is very important to differentiate. Each case in neuroophthalmology can be unique and presentations can be confusing. It is key to have history and examination for appropriate directed investigation and management. Thank you very much for the attention. Thank you so much, sir, for uh, Thank you, sir. wonderful Thank you. cases. Excellent presentation, sir. But then you are doing only Goldman, sir. You are not relying on Humphrey visual fields. No, of course, uh, we uh, preferably, in fact, because they're faster, we do Humphrey visual fields. But uh, often when we uh, don't understand the, because the Humphrey visual fields, especially in elderly and the patients who are doing it for the first time can be very uh, difficult. You'll get to see a lot of defects, which the patient is because of his lack of cooperation or understanding of the fields for the first time. So uh, again, for here, I use representative Goldman because they're very easy to understand Humphrey's can be difficult. In fact, because neurologists are here, this was one of the reasons why I took uh, Goldman, because our neurologists at AIMS uh, always ask for uh, Goldman. They are a little uncomfortable when we do Humphreys. But mm, I would say that if you want a quick field, you can even just go ahead and do a Humphrey 120 point screening. That is easy to do. And as we are not so worried about thresholding like glaucoma people are, so we get to understand the visual field effect very easily on that. And of course, a confrontation field. So uh, a Goldman actually represents a confrontation field very well. So that is why I show. But a Humphrey is now what I would say everybody is using and is probably as effective a, a, a tool as any. Exactly. Because as a private practitioner, we don't have Goldman. Yes. So we have approach to only Humphrey. Uh, uh, I'll just add one more thing here. That 120 point is better because it takes larger field into the view mm -hmm. compared to a 30-2. That Absolutely. is what is more important for a uh, neuroophthalmic defect in Humphreys. So in our practice, like being a private practitioner here, we also do a 120-point screening. Uh, we don't have access to Goldman here. So we can do that, Dr. Vinita. Yes, thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Anybody else wants to add something? Just one, one question. Uh, 
the two cases of uh, cysticercosis which you have shown yeah so uh when a diagnosis of exclusion or initially tried with steroids or upfront you started on elpendazole so how uh, yeah uh, uh, especially if the optic nerve is involved we give a uh, initial 3 to 5 days of uh, oral steroids before we add albendazole so we decrease the inflammation uh, before we start albendazole but invariably we have realized that in uh, um, albin um, cysticercosis involving muscles it it will take a much longer time if we just use steroids so that is why we do tend to use uh, albendazole in these cases a lot of i mean for cns tuberculosis often albendazole is not something that is preferred because of the damage that it causes and you require of course uh, and anti convulsants also but uh, in muscle we have realized it takes much longer for the muscles to actually restore motility that is why but yes we do initially load with the uh, prednisolone especially if it is close to the optic nerve or there is any visual function deficit because that of course gets aggravated by this and of course they did not have intraocular or intracranial cystitis which was essential uh, i have a question uh, to sir uh, what is the duration for ribendazole you have given means there is a lot of school of thought some gives 8 days 14 days 28 days so what was the duration for ribendazole so um, invariably we give from up to 3 to 4 weeks that is a uh, uh, usual that we do especially in in muscle involvements and uh, always we cover it up with steroids so you start with steroids first you add albendazole and invariably uh, we can't even call the patients too frequently so the next follow up after an early follow up would be close one month after the initial presentation after which we tend to stop albendazole and quickly taper off steroids so that's our usual routine uh, of course it depends on the st- the response also of the patient so if there is poor response you may consider giving it slightly longer but usually within a month you know that the cyst is dead and the residual limitation may be because of the fibrosis associated with the inflammation of the dying cyst thanks for asking the problem is uh, when mri is normal and uh, there is a problem with the fields and optic nerve then what thing that thing what to do so of course so we have some set up in case between ophthalmologist and neurologist so uh, of course a lot of neuroophthalmological conditions which cause visual deficit may not have very significant uh, imaging findings of course there are two reasons why we realize uh, imaging often turns out to be negative initially one that the signs on the imaging may not be so evident at for the start say for uh, retrocranial pressure except slight dilatation or distension of the sheath the mri brain is going to be absolutely normal now, again for uh, a retrobulbar neuritis or optic neuritis which is isolated and not associated with multiple sclerosis the brain will be normal so unless you do a uh, um, uh, uh, mri orbits also with contrast with fat suppression you will not be able to pick up the optic nerve enhancement so um, of course uh, when this when you discuss optic neuritis we will discuss this but that's why and the other thing we have found like i said that localize the lesion because sometimes we've had lesions being missed because the neurologist or the uh, um, the radiologist is not you know told where exactly to look so a radiologist may do a routine mri screen often when we send him for imaging they are by technicians and not the uh, radiologist is not there he just reviews the images so if he doesn't know where to look for he will not uh you know image those areas or even if they are imaged on an mri he will not take those sections and send them to you so if you suspect it's a brain cell lesion do not do a ct do an mri if you suspect it's an orbital lesion often a brain is in brain like like in these cases we localize it to the orbit if cost is a constraint even a ct of the orbit would with contrast would show us much more than an mri brain would so you are actually spending more money with getting less information so localizing the lesion giving a suspicion doing directed and appropriate investigations these are you know key for pick up and of course often diseases evolve when initial investigations may turn out to be negative with over time you may get positive signs as the disease evolves in the body exactly so tarik verma sir you wanted to say something i have one question to ask and that is in uh, neurology we have a concept of dying cyst you know right when the cyst is dying you know it more often enhances 
and sometimes we may not give elmetazole because we would wait for some time and see the cyst it, it uh, reach, degenerates by itself. We do give steroids to bring down the inflammation there. And the second issue is that you might have done the brain MRI also because if are associated okay. a lot of brain cysts, you know, then you'll end up in trouble because they will all die and will have inflammatory. Yeah, absolutely. So any of this concept in your ophthalmology also? So, uh, so uh, first, of course, I'll take your very, very important second point first. Uh, no uh, albendazole should be given without ruling out intraocular and intracranial cysticercosis. Albendazole is actually, as we started the discussion, is contraindicated, or at least not without a cover of steroids and uh, uh, probably uh, uh, anti-epileptics also. So uh, absolutely, uh, of course, an MRI brain was done. So if, uh, my aim was to talk about localizing. So if you have localized even on a CT that is a cysticercosis, you would require an MRI brain to rule out cysticercosis intracranial and of course do an directed indirect of the um, I to rule out an intraocular cystic cirrhosis before you would start almondazole. Uh, absolutely, sir. I like I said, even the neurologists are generally very keen, not very keen to give albendazole. What we have seen is there is ocular motility defect. Then, because of the dying cyst causing prolonged uh, inflammation leading to fibrosis, the cyst is dead. There is no more inflammation, but the motility is not completely restored. So the patient will continue to have diplopia, limitation of movement, or ptosis because of the fibrosis that the cyst now caused which would result us in operating for the strabismus. So that is why we want that, you know, the cyst should die as quickly as possible with as minimal inflammation and fibrosis as possible so that we, we are able to get good ocular motility. Otherwise, then what happens is a few months down the line, because of the diplopia that the patient persists with, we have to do an, a, a strabismus surgery to correct for the diplopia. So that is why we prefer albendazole. But it's a very dying cyst, and you can see that it's not really causing significant inflammation. Maybe you can avoid albendazole and just go ahead with steroids. Yes, sir. Right, sir. Just one uh, uh, comment only. Dr. Rohi told intracranial, probably it is uh, he means intraventricular. Ventricular. Intracranial, we do give. Uh, right. Probably, sir, you, you mean to say yeah. intraventricular. So ventricular just a yes. correction for. Very yeah. commonly ki in our residency days, ki aap ka intra rule out out then we can add. And yes. albendazole we do give. And if more than um, uh, uh, dual antiparasitic drug we used to give, and a degenerative MRI gives an uh, impression that it is degenerative, then we avoid. Otherwise, uh, resolution is better. So just only it was correction. Probably, probably, probably sir, message might have gone to intra Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Now I think uh, time to move ahead and we will uh, have our uh, one first state of presentation on optic neuritis. From the ophthalmological perspective, I invite Dr. Priti Singh to share her screen, please. Dr. Priti? Yes, ma'am, I'm sharing. Am I audible, ma'am? Yes, perfect. You can go ahead. Okay. Good evening, all. Uh, thanks, BDOS, for providing me this opportunity. Today, I'll be speaking on optic neuritis from ophthalmologist's perspective. Though it's a huge topic to be covered in eight minutes, but I try to cover it under these headings. We all know that optic neuritis is an inflammatory, infective, or demyelinating process affecting the optic nerve. Uh, the annual incidence is around three to five per one lakh, whereas prevalence is around one hundred and fifteen per one lakh. Majority develops optic neuritis between 15 to 45 years of age and women are affected more commonly. Demyelination is a pathological process in which the normally myelinated nerve fibers, they lose their insulating myelin sheath and because of that, the conduction defect occurs. Ophthalmoscopically, optic neuritis is of three types. Petrobulba neuritis in which the optic nerve head and the fundus is totally normal, most frequent type in adults and it is frequently associated with multiple sclerosis. It is typically defined as a condition where neither the ophthalmologist nor the patient sees anything. 
Papillitis is characterized by hyperemia and edema, but is with uh, flame-shaped hemorrhages over the disc. But it is more common in uh, children and it is usually unilateral. Neuroretinitis is papillitis in association with inflammation of the retinal fiber layer and macular star formation. It is the least common type and is only rarely a manifestation of demyelination. So whenever you find neuroretinitis, look for other infectious causes also. Cat scratch disease is responsible for 60% of the cases of neuroretinitis as per literature. Uh, optic neuritis can be idiopathic. It could be associated with demyelinating disorders. It can be para-infectious or infectious in etiology. Uh, or it may be associated with certain immune-mediated disorders or metabolic disorders. Among the demyelinating disorders, the most common association is multiple sclerosis. Although uh, many patients with optic neuritis have no clinically demonstrable association with multiple sclerosis, but approximately 15 to 20 percent of the MS patients they present with optic neuritis, and optic neuritis occurs at some point in 50 percent of the patients with established multiple sclerosis. One important thing is in patient with uh, first attack of optic neuritis, if there was winter onset or if there was actually DR2 positivity or UTOF phenomena was present, the subsequent risk of MS is increased. Sudden progressive profound visual loss is the hallmark of acute optic neuritis. Uh, the vision loss reaches a trough about one week after the onset. The, it is mostly unilateral but may be bilateral and typically affects 15 to 45 years of age. Dark adaptation may be lowered. Impairment of color vision is always present in optic neuritis. There is typical red desaturation and an easy test to check for this red desaturation is to ask the patient to compare any red color object with both eyes separately. The patient with monocular involvement will uh, report a washed out color with the involved eye. There will be also reduced perception of light intensity in patients with optic neuritis. Patient may complain of mild dull eye ache, which is more marked in patients with retrobulbar neuritis than with papillitis. The reason is uh, uh, the fibers of superior rectus muscle, they are adhered to the dura near the annulus of zinc and, that is, and it is the part which is involved in retrobulbar neuritis. And this pain is usually aggravated by optic movements. But this symptom is present only in the initial phase and it, it disappears in a few days. Episodic transient obscuration of vision on exertion and on exposure to heat, which occurs on resting or moving away from the heat, occurs in patients with isolated optic neuritis. And this is known as UTOF symptom, which is one of the risk for factors for subsequent development of multiple sclerosis. Depth perception, particularly for the moving object, may be impaired and this is known as pulpish phenomena. Visual equity is usually markedly reduced in optic neuritis. Television is often severely impaired. Pupil shows ill-sustained constriction to light. Markers than pupil, which can be elicited by swinging flashlight test, it indicates relative afferent pathway defect and is a diagnostic sign of optic neuritis. The most common field defect in optic neuritis is a relative central or centrocecal scotoma, which is more marked for red color than for white. These are the various types of field defects seen in patients with optic neuritis. Contrast sensitivity is also impaired in patients with optic neuritis. Now, in majority of the patients, especially with demyelinating disorders, the vision starts to improve in the second or the third week, and by the fourth or fifth week, visual activity returns to normal or near normal. But color vision, contrast sensitivity, and visual fields take longer to recover and may never return completely to normal sometimes. But if this clinical course is not followed, we should suspect atypical optic neuritis. Now, the most important task for ophthalmologists regarding the management of optic neuritis is to differentiate between typical and atypical optic neuritis and also to differentiate optic neuritis from other simulating ocular conditions. Uh, features of op typical optic neuritis we have already discussed. Predominantly, it affects females. Age group is 15 to 45. It is mostly unilateral. Acute painful vision loss occur over hours to days. Retroorbital pain, which worsens with eye movements, and peak, loss visual, uh, peak visual loss within two weeks after which improvement occurs. Features of atypical optic neuritis are patient out of the typical age range, no pain on eye movements, poor vision persisting beyond two weeks from the onset, and progressive diminution of vision beyond the first week. So whenever you find features of atypical optic neuritis, do thorough investigations to find out other causes of optic neuritis, that is other than the demyelinating disorder. Another important task for ophthalmologists is to differentiate uh, optic neuritis from similar ocular conditions. Like papillitis should be differentiated from uh, conditions where, it, where there is disc edema. Uh, they are papilledema, pseudopapilledema or papillitis, which is seen in hypermetropia and optic disc etc. etc. Anterior ischemic optic neuropathy 
and grade 4 hypertensive retinopathy. Whereas acute retro retrobulbar colitis should be differentiated from malingering, posterior ischemic optic neuropathy, hysterical blindness, and quadrant blindness. In all these four, the fundus will be normal, but patient will be complaining of loss of vision. Now to reach to a confirmatory diagnosis, we need to do thorough clinical workup and a few investigations. Take careful history, do complete ophthalmic examination. Uh, visual fluid loss to some extent is universal in optic neuritis, so do perimetry. It will help in quantifying the depth of the visual field loss and also aid in consultation about the prognosis because deeper the visual field loss, poorer will be the visual prognosis. If, you, if it is a first attack or if you are suspecting atypical optic neuritis, certain additional tests also should be done. This is uh, the visual wave potential shows prolonged latency and reduced amplitude in patients with optic neuritis. This is a pattern reversal BEP in a patient with left eye optic neuritis. As we can see, in left eye, the amplitude is uh, reduced and the latency is prolonged. Optical coherence tomography is a good method of uh, good investigation to evaluate the RNFL uh, status in patients with uh, optic neuritis. In acute phase, there will be RNFL thickening in the peripheral area in papillitis and there will be no changes in retrobulbar neuritis, whereas over some time, the RNFL thinning evolves. Now, T2-weighted and gadolinum enhancing MRI are useful in the diagnosis of multiple sclerosis. There is one McDonald's criteria for the diagnosis of multiple sclerosis, according to which uh, dissemination in space and dissemination in time are required for the diagnosis. What is dissemination in space? It is actually the presence of two lesions in at least two of the four locations that are periventricular, juxtacortical, infratentorial, and spinal cord. Whereas dissemination in time means simultaneous presence of two lesions, out of which one should be gadolinum enhancing, the other one should be non enhancing. So, according to the old criteria, if both are present, DIS and DIT, after one attack, the diagnosis of MS is confirmed, otherwise, you will have to wait for the second attack. But now, in order to allow an early diagnosis to be made, uh, the criteria has been revised and uh, according to this new criteria, if there is GIS on MRI and CSA polyvoclonal bands present, no need of DIT on MRI, you can make the diagnosis of uh, MS even in with one attack. This is a picture, uh, this is an MRI showing periventricular plaques, uh, this is typical known as Dawson's finger in patients with MS. Now, CSF analysis is useful whenever MRI is doubtful because all of this may be covered by Dr. Pratik. is a useful Dr. predictor may cover some of, of multiple sclerosis. Yeah. Tests are necessary to differentiate typical from atypical optic neuritis and to determine the prognosis or risk for subsequent development of multiple sclerosis. Treatment is guided by the degree of patient's visual loss, visual needs, presence of previous episodes, results of MRI, and specific etiology if identified. Like, like if primary disease is identified, it needs appropriate treatment. There was one optic neuritis treatment trial study, which was a multi-center study done in 15 centers in USA with the objectives to evaluate the efficacy of steroids in the treatment of optic neuritis and to investigate the relationship between optic neuritis and multiple sclerosis. And the inclusion criteria of ONTT were that of the typical optic neuritis, that is the age range should be that of the typical acute unilateral loss of vision should be there, RAPD should be present, and no systemic disease should be there other than multiple sclerosis. Then they have divided the patient into three groups. First group was given oral prednisolone for 14 days. Another group was given intravenous methyl prednisolone for three days, followed by oral prednisolone for 11 days. And the third group was given oral placebo for 14 days. The major findings of ONTT were intravenous methylprednisolone treatment hastens the visual recovery, but it does not affect the long-term visual outcome. Patients treated with oral prednisolone alone demonstrate an increased risk of recurrent optic neuritis, so never treat a patient of optic neuritis with oral prednisolone alone. Monosymptomatic patients in IVMP group had a reduced rate of development of multiple sclerosis during the first two years of follow-up. Immunomodulatory treatment also reduces the progression of clinical MS in some patients. Options are interferon, beta, tericonamide, and glatiramer, etc. There are many clinical trials which have been done to find out whether early treatment with these immunomodulators can delay the second event of multiple sclerosis. And all um, have almost the similar outcome that, yes, if you start early treatment with immunomodulators, it delays the second event of multiple sclerosis. But definitely, risk versus benefit should be kept in mind. 
intravenous immunoglobulin treatment is still in experimental phase so the management recommendations are in patients with typical clinical course and examination findings of monosymptomatic demyelinating optic neuritis that is first demyelinating event do mri of the brain if it is doubtful do csf analysis macdonald criteria we have already discussed so if mri and csf fulfill the macdonald criteria uh, for acute phase we can give intravenous methyl prednisolone 1 gram per day in single or divided doses for 3 days followed by oral prednisolone uh, 1 mg per kg per day, uh, for 11 days and then fast tapering in 4 days and to prevent uh, second attack of ms you can give any of these immunomodulator regimes but better refer to refer the patient to a neurologist in monosymptomatic patients who does not fit into mcdonald's criteria the recent one or those or for those whom in, in, in whom the diagnosis of ms has already been established intravenous methyl prednisolone can be given to hasten the visual recovery but has not been demonstrated to improve the long term visual outcome so the take home message is do thorough examination including history taking try to differentiate typical from atypical and also from other similar other conditions if first episode of optic neuritis with no clinical signs of ms get mri and other investigations done for acute phase if mri suggests ms give igmp regime and refer the patient to neurologist and if recurrence occur in already or diagnosed case of ms igmp can be given to hasten the visual recovery if not contraindicated thank you very good thank presentation you, very good thank you now i will invite dr pratik sharma sir to say from the neurological perspective and then we can discuss optic neuritis thanks a lot uh, dr neeta and abdus for providing this opportunity it may sound to be a little bit more pitched because of the discuss most of the things which you already had so take some time so but uh, i will like thank dr bt that the take home message that patient is having optic neuritis at least refer the patient at least once to the neurologist so i will request dr bt mrani and all the optimists to have a, keep this take home message if anything like this please refer once at least to the neurologist uh, so start with the optic neuritis diagnosis and treatment and uh, perspective of neurologist uh there will be some repetition so we will go fast if something looking looking like that is repeating so what is optic neuritis is a acute illness we have to keep in mind the moment we are saying acute neuritis is acute thing it's usually usually non infectious and it's inflammatory and demyelinating illness so it could be a start of any first attack of demyelinating illness which could be multiple sclerosis or even the nmosd or other illnesses which has came into picture much more commonly than, than previously now now doc neurologists are much more into all these things and can we start off the some other demyelinating illness which of vasculitic origin so optic neuritis can start of them visual loss is acute and usually monocular and is highly associated with the multiple sclerosis uh, which is on um, 50 to 20% presenting case and it may present uh, throughout the course in 50% of cases female preponderance uh, around 2/3 of cases are uh, comprised by the females are the having 2/3 of cases age is usually a, they are young people so we have to be aggressively otherwise patient patient loss vision and its affect uh, around 5 in per, per lakh uh, population and around 115 per lakh uh, in us a uh, same similar uh, epidemiology is also in india also in the studies from the south so classical triad of clinical feature is unital vision loss peripheral pain impaired color vision usually on monocular but can occur bilocular bilateral symptoms can be there in 10% cases and if bilateral is there this is common in edm so less than 12 to 15 year of age in asian and black south population we are edm acute disseminated encephalomyelitis is common and also japanese uh, multiple sclerosis or what we can used to call japanese multiple sclerosis now become the nmo spectrum disorder and another new illness which i am more intrigued about is mnmo mog igg disease myelin oligodendro site black protein igg disease which is almost we have like edm and this almost get going into the spectrum with them so recurrent edm may turn out to be mog ig disease so bile disease are common if you don't suspecting uh, mog or edm or least kind of symptom then we should also look for the other possible cause of optic neuropathy clinical feature is always vision loss and eye pain uh, we already discussed continuous situation we look for the other causes 
Eye pain is a very important thing. There's pain on the ocular movement. Is in 22 percent cases of an OVDT trial were having pain. Again, we have discussed RAPD was there. So we are, there's a chances of RAPD which we can be find out on a swinging light test. We discussed all this. Visual field loss uh, is always centrosecular scotoma. For different type of all type of vision loss, uh, field loss is there. So we are not finding centrosecular scotoma. It still it can be obtained right test. Fundus examination already been discussed by the doctor. Etiology we come with. This is a typical optic neuritis. Then it's always, always associated with the multiple hepatitis. And uh, we have seen that it's present within 30-30% cases. And if, there, if the first tag is there, there's chances of almost five-year risk of 38% of dropping into multiple sclerosis. And if not uh, typical, then it's atypical. With typical multiple hepatitis can improve without being steroid also. So, but only on OTTL steroid hasten the recovery, but ultimately can reduce the chances of development of materials at the uh, two years, at after two years, but it can be, uh, there is no long-term benefit was there. When atypical symptoms are there, bilateral or anything, then it's become more steroid dependent, yeah, like the sarcoids, like the SLEs, the RMO or any sort disorder, and other vasculitis can present with obtainitis, which requires steroid uh, for long-term period of time. We have patients who are steroid dependent also, the moment you remove, develop recurrence. There are illnesses like SION, Creon, which require long-term steroid treatment for the optic neuritis. We have discussed this, but the difference is uh, if young child is there, always look for the infection, post-infection cause. And if older patient there, then we should not miss the AION, ischemic optic neuropathy, arthritic or non arthritic type. Uh, and other toxic um, uh, labor hereditary optic neuropathy, we have to keep in the mind. Toxic metabolic cause is also there. So we, we should keep in the mind whenever we are dealing with this kind of patients. Diagnosis always, always clinical. Our history and examination gives us all the information. A detailed optimal examination. So from uh, support from the uh, optimal colleague is very much important. And our diagnosis testing should be there to make the diagnosis, confirm the diagnosis and look for the typical uh, cases. Are we dealing with the multiple sclerosis or similar like illness or something else? So this is the more important reason to investigate and diagnose with what we are dealing with. What Dr. Saxena says, make localized lesion to so localize the illness, identify the illness and treat it. From the neurologist perspective, we should always do the MRI brain with contrast with or with, or, with, or, with or, which also. With, it will confirm the diagnosis of, uh, of the multi optic neuritis and always or gives us information whether it's going to patients going to develop the MS or MS like illness or MOSD because if we say that uh, there's some chances of lesion in the brain, this dose and finger or ovoid lesion are there, we can make it diagnosis of attack of uh, obtained varieties of first attack of MS on one go. Previously, it used to require two attacks. Down back dose the criteria was there. Dr. Priti has discussed that. But this thing I might done is the moment patient having varieties, we should not miss the chances to make a diagnosis of multiple sclerosis up front. And we should start the patient on treatment that decision modifying medication as early as possible if patient has obtained rightis and is turned out to be a possible case of multiple process. In uh, MRI, we can see around 95% cases of thick inflammation, uh, thickening, what we say, or gradual enhancement, we can see. And that can persist up to six weeks also. From first, in the first 20 days, you can find it out on 95% uh, cases and up to six weeks, 90% yes, can this MRI can persist. So, listen, if there is a finding, specific finding in MRI, us find that there is a lesion in optic chiasma, optic tract, and longitudinal extensive lesion of rift bulbary optic nerve, then this more than seen in the animal spectrum disorder and animal disease. While the white matter normalities we are seeing avoid uh, very ventricular lesion, juxtaparticular or, or infratentorial, or even in the spinal cord, then more chances of having multiple sclerosis. And this uh, Prevalence of white metal lesion varies from in optic neuritis cases around 23 to 75 percent cases. So, if you're doing the MRI, then we have more chances of making the ultimate diagnosis, which may be a multiple process also. So, lumbar puncture uh, usually usually is not a very essential diagnostic test, but should be considered when we are dealing with a typical case like bilateral presentation when we are suspecting AMO or edem or mock disease less than 15 of A's again infectious and edem chances are there if the symptoms are resting on infection. And if we ever do, then what are the findings we find out? We find elevated protein and lymphocytic pleocytosis, which is seen around 60 to 80 percent cases. And the important thing, which is now came into picture, like olive oil brand, which previously we used not to give that much importance, but it came into picture since the McDonald's 2017 criteria, where it's just given as importance of DIT dissemination time. If you have one first attack 
and uh, positive uh, OCV, then we can make a diagnosis of multiple sclerosis. Myelin basin protein we also seen in 20% cases and IgG index also in 20 to 35% cases. VEP, VEP uh, is a very good, important tool. Uh, although it's not, uh, not it's a very important uh, tool, but it's not able to differentiate between different causes of, of neuritis, but can, can be very helpful in subtle cases and when we are suspecting it's malignant. So, and what we find it is delay in the p latency, and which is actually a manifestation of slow conduction and a kind of axonal demyelination in the optic nerve. But the abnormal process in around up to 80-90% case up to one year and 35% will turn normal after at the 32 years, so around 70 5% still remain abnormal at the two years. So once somebody has an attack of tendritis, we still do, uh, let us, uh, we do a VEP, can, we can find abnormalities and that can be helpful in making diagnosis of multiple sclerosis like illnesses. And this is another important thing, a couple four specific antibody, which is uh, where sacrosanct and very important diagnostic tool for uh, animal, animal and animal spectrum disorders. This we used to call Davic disease. It, the patient, this, these illnesses can present with the kind of tendritis, where usually have bilateral one, if in the one consensual one by one or sequentially or at the, at one go also. Usually they have normal MRI brain or very brain abnormality which are very not specific of multiple sclerosis and zero positivity for this kind of antibodies 30 to 40 30 to 70 percent and now we have NMO spectrum disorder where we have a zero, zero positive and zero negative uh, uh, kind of uh, two kind of uh, part. So when we can have an illnesses with zero positive one and we have a zero negative one. So this is a very important tool. Treatment. Treatment means AMC is to improve the vision of preventing the, the development of multiple sclerosis. Treatments comprise of as the ONTT trial, one is oral one that can be one for 14 days, 11 days, then four day trial, four day taper, or IV metaprenicillin 1000 mg per day, maybe in dividers or in a single dose that were around three to five days and followed by oral, oral one mg per kg 11, for 11 days followed by four day taper. What does ethyl penicillin does? It does split of the function of the year outcome are same. It reduces the risk of conversion to the multiple uh, within two years. The chances versus uh, placebo versus uh, oral penicillin, the chances 7.5% versus 14.7% and 67% with the uh, placebo. And with among patients with two white metal lesions on MRI, incident is with MS or 62.2% versus 324 with oral penicillin, 35.9 with uh, placebo. So no difference in rates of MS between treatment group at five years. So whatever steroid we are giving, we are reducing the chances of developing MS at um, two years. So we otherwise at the five five year down the line, it may be having same rates. What, what if we do oral steroid? What is the difference? So there are higher chances of recurrence of opting right in both high when compared with the methyl penicillin IV. And 10 years, the risk of obtaining neuritis remain high in oral penicillin group when compared with the IV group, there's 44 versus 29. But there is no longer difference between oral penicillin and placebo group. And no dif difference between treatment group with regard to visual outcome, outcome at area or risk of doubling additional demyelinases at one year. So what steroid we are giving is just going to reduce the chances of doubling multiple sclerosis and reduce the chances of recurrence. And if you are doing oral steroid lesser dose, then there is no chance for recurrence. So, if this is just a uh, layout, how to approach any patient of suspected opting neuritis, if there is a typical symptom, consider multiple sclerosis or clinical isolated syndrome to MRI vein that is suggestive of multiple sclerosis, yes, give IV steroid, follow up, consider for the DC DMD, disease modifying therapies. If do, then give IV steroid, follow up, no risk of uh, MS, chances of SIO and recurrent inflammatory neuropathy there, then consider repeat imaging follow up. If there's a typical symptom, chances of inflammatory of the disease beyond infectious, ischemic, compressive neuropathy, or toxic are chances there. Further workup is MRI brains, yourself, ANA done, and specific diagnosis and treatment should be done. So the summary summarize over opting neuritis can be first manifestation of the continuous process. A thorough history target of neurological and neurological examination is important with the patient presenting with typical symptom. Condition that makes opti uh, opting right should be considered and the typical features should be promptly investigated with MRI and CSF if required. And intermittent metastasis should be considered for rapid visual recovery after seeing all the possible side effects and caveat that the treatment is not going to alter the final outcome. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Pratik. Thank you so much. Now the topic of optic neuritis is open for discussion. Dr. Rohit, I want to ask, uh, what are the percentage of MS patients if we see in total optic neuritis? 
and do we give steroid to all patients how long whether uh, oral or systemic so this is actually <laughs> completely covering our optic deriders but yes so uh, primary question how many we see unfortunately uh, you know we uh, so optic you know, the diagnosis or their final visual acuity was much poorer as compared to those that was reported by ONTT and over time what we have realized is that probably a lot of these patients were probably nmo and uh, a lot of nmo is now in india as in asia and india as compared to uh, the caucasian population so that is why it becomes a far more important for us to be aware of this nmo nmosd which dr pratik was talking about so a lot of our patients may not be ms typical may have nmo or mog which may present initially like optic neuritis but their final outcomes would be much poorer they are not going to recover vision as is seen in ontt and often come uh, very quickly with other eye involvement or uh, you know neurological sequelae like lower limb weakness so first key thing to remember is nmo is an important diagnosis now now we so we it has affected ophthalmologist per se or at least our practice is that now even if the vision is not so poor we start we definitely recommend iv methylprednisolone the reason is that it has been seen for nmo that early steroids makes a huge difference in the long term outcome in fact for nmo you need to be very very aggressive if three or five doses does not improve vision with neurologist we talk for plasma pheresis so these are things that have now evolved and changed over the past 10 years as our understanding of disease has improved so if a patient of optic neuritis comes uh, if you are pretty confident that it is optic neuritis typical presentation which dr pratik showed give iv methylprednisolone now the rule is you must do an mri unless like you know you really have financial issues do an mri brain and orbits with contrast with flare or fat suppression essentially to be able to highlight those involvement of the lesion these are very key ct is not going to help unless it's atypical so the big sure a very very important classification the moment the presentation is there if it's typical it is most likely ms although you may have other things like nmo and all but most likely ms if it is an atypical presentation it is less likely to be ms although it, it's not that it won't ever be but it's less likely to be ms but you need to really investigate well and rule out other causes before we start thinking and treating like ms so that's the key aggression on investigations particularly the moment the patient has very severe visual loss does not improve vision get an nmo antibody test because that is going to change our intervention very early and if the patient recovers well and is doing well you can just follow up and maybe just uh, and <laughs> the key discussion is discussion and correlation with the neurologist it's very, very important the neurologist must refer to us because we've had patients treated as um, ms who actually had ischemic optic neuropathy because in india we see ischemic optic neuropathy now at a much younger age so we seen ischemic optic neuropathies in children or in um, students as young as in their 20s so although that's an extremely rare thing but peri 40 is what we see in ischemic optic neuropathy so neurologist should ideally get an ophthal review as dr pratik talked about to classify to identify the optic nerve and the visual functions and as ophthalmology the moment we suspect any neuroophthalmological disorder and if it's obviously ophthalmological like ischemic optic neuropathy or an orbital lesion must get a neurological review so we are looking at the bottom line for our understanding and management of optic neuritis yes exactly that's the advancement of seeing lot of nmos exactly dr yeah. pratik has told any other uh, point uh, anybody uh, want that iv methylprednisolone which is recommended is the 3 days or 5 days dr roy said it is 5 days and other speakers says 3 days what is the current situation so uh, our treatment was started by ontt and ontt also used 3 days just as an arbitrary because they also didn't know 
this started in the uh, 1990s. The protocol was made in 1989 when we didn't understand the disease. So they gave IV methylprednisone for three days. Uh, now neurologists are becoming more aggressive, giving it for five days. If you think it's multiple sclerosis or isolated optic neuritis, you could give it for three days only. If there is inadequate visual recovery, or if you are suspecting that there there is a likelihood of NMO. As I said, our aggression increases. We can give up to five days and then give oral. If it is NMO, the oral taper becomes much longer than what the ONTT actually talked about for 14 days, which was essentially to balance the oral treatment. So, our intervention for oral steroids become much longer with a very slow taper. So, uh, again, it's a case by case approach. Essentially, following OTT, three days is enough. But the moment you suspect or the patient has not improved, then you can continue for five days. Thank you. One thing I also um, want to add, one entity is recurrent uh, uh, optic neuritis. That probably is missing. So MRI is normal and patient is getting every few days. One is chronic recurrent and another is some recurrent. So also it also requires immunosuppression. So probably we don't need also some antibody mediated. We are not able to... Uh, diagnose it, but this is also an entity. Rest of the things were covered and it is very nice discussion and Dr. Rohit explained it very nicely. But three days or five days. So it is always with neurologists always for five days, whether yeah. because investigation of MOG or NMO, these things will be coming after five days. So we can't wait for that. So we usually in MS or optic neuritis, we use since AIMS also in AIMS early also we used to follow five days. Uh, yeah. Probably so five days is a good thing. And one extra thing is MRI also helps us to diagnose it is a MOG versus a NMO versus MS. So a little bit uh, pattern of optic nerve in, in tract or chiasma involvement or retrobulbar part involvement. Uh, some clue we are getting with the radiology also. So neuroradiology we are missing. We are talking of neurology and uh, ophthalmology. <laughs> radiology is also important part. Absolutely. Exactly. Uh, I wanted to come on to this point for uh, Ankur Sinhagar. There is a recurrent uh, optic neuritis or there is an involvement of other eye patients becomes more conscious, more uh, asking questions like what exactly is going to happen to my other eye because sometimes they lose one eye and there is a attack in the other eye. So what should we be looking for and what should we do for the patients carefully? Uh, thanks Dr. Vinita and Vidos for having me here. I would just add one more thing to the previous discussion we were having about the steroids, that in the private practice, if you're practicing as a solo ophthalmologist, always after the second dose of steroid, before you give a third dose of steroid, get the evaluation done by the physician, especially for the electrolytes and all. Because sometimes you have an electrolyte which can go haywire, and then practicing solo ophthalmologist, you are pretty much confirmed that it is just an optic neuritis. You may land up into problems because of electrolyte imbalances. So that is one one medical legal point or one uh, word of caution I just wanted to give. Second thing is if you're having a second attack or bilateral attacks, uh, I mean second attack more likely you have you will have to think think it as a two lesion, which can be considered as a second uh, site of involvement. So now this is a, a difficult scenario where you have to kind of Look into the history, how the other eye has recovered one. If the other eye has recovered one uh, very nicely and we are looking at, we are, we are looking at a typical optic neuritis, more likely that this eye will also recover. But then you have to rope in a neurologist here. Because now, since you have two sites, I mean two eyes involving in different point in time, so you have a recurrence or a two-site involvement. So there is high likelihood that the patient can have multiple sclerosis. And if you still feel that, you know, the patient is not improving or... Uh, there are issues. There were there were there were a kind of uh, some kind of incomplete improvement in the previous episode. Then more likely you are having you are going to have something else than a typical optic neuritis here. So you need to again uh, investigate deeply as we have already discussed about the uh, uh, MOG and the uh, NMO, which can kind of uh, uh, affect the outcome despite this device. Here. And maybe if it is very very significantly recurrent. recurrent uh, a slight dependent kind of thing or uh, prion as discussed, then we may have to even give some disease modifying agents. Again, we have to have uh, some consensus to the neurologist here. Yeah, one more point I want to add. It was a great presentation by both Dr. Preeti and Dr. Pratik Sharma. Uh, one thing is sometimes these patients, they have recurrence of attack in the same eye and they have been diagnosed NMO uh, previously. 
But the point is, if they are already on immunosuppressants, they already had taken uh, methylprid and steroids for long. But again, they come back with uh, reporting with complaints like they are having now diminution of vision again. In such scenarios, sometimes it is very difficult to whether to start on IV methylprid again or what to do. This is sometimes what we face in real uh, practice scenario. So uh, I would just say that one uh, recurrent optic neuritis is a pretty characteristic feature or is pretty typical of MOG positivity. Of course, MOG is something which we are still understanding, like NMO, our understanding has increased over the past 10 to 15 years since the antibody was reported. Um, understanding of MOG is still evolving. But a lot of these patients we used to think as cryon or recurrent optic neuritis or steroid dependent were probably MOG. But that's, that's still an evolving understanding. Now, if even on immunosuppression or on disease-modifying drugs, you have a recurrence and you are sure it is a definite involvement of the optic nerve, sometimes there is a little fluctuation as was presented uh, that the vision may improve, go up and down a little, temperature-related changes. If that is there, that's, that's okay. You can let that pass. You may ask the patient to follow up. But if there is a definite decrease in vision or an involvement, you need to give IV methylprednisolone again because it is acting like a recurrent episode. So it essentially means that obviously the disease modifying agents or immunosuppressive agents that you are using are not effective enough. And of course, you need to stop the current inflammatory episode or the demyelinating event by giving IV methylprednisolone and maybe uh, re-looking at the chronic uh, disease modifying or immunosuppression that you are treating the patient with, of course, again, in conjunction with a neurologist. Uh, one you, more thing. What, what about the poorly controlled diabetic? How you treat? Any change in the guideline? So, uh, first episode of patient who has diabetes, uh, and I would, like I said, now err on the side of giving IV methylprednisone, especially if I'm sure it's multiple sclerosis uh, or optic neuritis. If it is if I'm suspicious, I may still defer if there is diabetes. But if I am sure it is optic neuritis and I and I would want to give IV methylprednisolone, alone, I would again with a physician plan to give insulin along with the IV methylprednisolone alone because it is essential to give, but you don't want the blood sugars to become haywire. Maybe you could defer it by a day or so to help the physician to control the blood sugars and be able to titrate the amount of insulin required. But... I would say that it is essential. My modification in patients of diabetes would be related to the division of oral steroids. So I may, if the diabetes is very poorly controlled, we may not give the concurrent oral steroids for a period of time uh, because then he's not admitted and insulin may be a little issue. But uh, the initial IV methylprednisolone, I think, is essential because it helps. So it's not just anti-inflammatory. There is a lot of effect of the IV methylprednisolone at the doses at which we are giving. And that's why the oral levels are not oral uh, methylprednisolone came out to be actually increasing recurrence. There is one study that has compared, uh, has used oral methyl, uh, oral visolone at uh, equivalent doses of one gram methylprednisolone, which has said that effects are good. Of course, it's a short study and there's not enough as compared to the ONDT, but the key thing is oral steroids of normal doses are contraindicated and in diabetics you could avoid them. But IV methylprednisolone is now a little more aggressive, I would say. Thank you. Dr. Saxena, would you advocate yes, if Dr. Dr. Chavi was saying that if uh, the patient having optic neuritis, recurrent optic neuritis, and the patient is already on most so straight away going to plasmapheresis rather than waiting during a second right trial. Because it has been mentioned that patients who are not going to recover well with a steroid can go ahead with a, especially in NMO and MOG where the chances of recovery is poor, we can go to the plex. Although time is not advisable, which time we start, but can we, can we do it early? One could, but I guess usually plex is never so rapidly arranged. So I would say the moment you identify a recurrence, you immediately give IV methylprednisolone. And if you feel that the vision has not improved or it's not showing that within a day or two, you can work towards giving a management going for flex. So, I mean, like IV methylprednisolone is now like an urgent emergent, uh, you know, in intervention that you must do. And flex is if, you know, you fail or 
you have a few days to arrange for plex because that is also not something so easily available so at least at our hospital that's how we go and um, yeah plex is now something which is again, very aggressively being touted for nmo but still we know that initially it does respond adequately to an iv methylprednisolone so it also gives us time to arrange for everything what we are planning for that's but it's a difficult question to answer at the moment just uh, one comment in continuation with dr rohit uh, because he is a doctor modulator in drug and then he developed recurrence so we may have to uh, look the whether our uh, immunomodulator drug was effective or not so other maps are available now and if it is a nmo spectrum usually nmo is mog has some indolent course nmo spectrum uh, disorder then uh, rituximab or tocilizumab those so those maps are also available depending upon risk benefit ratio we can move to those immunomodulator drugs also so other drugs and the other thing is the plex usually we wait for uh, improvement or not no improvement then only but it also also has a lot of complications yeah thank you thank you so much for such a wonderful discussion on optic neuritis now can i add to... can i add one point So, sure, sir. Sure. Yeah. See, uh, optic neuritis is not equivalent to multiple sclerosis. You know, more and more we are seeing NMO spectrum disorders and MOG. Both the two are more aggressive than MS. You know, and the treatment and guidelines are still uh, foggy. You know, so we have to be very careful when we follow these patients up, particularly when they ask the involvement of the Uh, other eye so we have to be very careful and i think in a patient who comes with optic neuritis looking into the other eye is very very important and following the other eye because even on mri the clue is the involvement of the other optic nerve so neuroimaging repeatedly doing in neuroimaging if possible after few months time and doing nmo antibody acupuncture antibodies may be much more important then just chasing multiple sclerosis because these two diseases are very aggressive they involve the other eye they involve both the eyes they poorly respond to treatment and the treatment itself is very toxic like uh, rituximab or azathioprine yeah so we have to be very alert in our situation in our scenario thank you yeah one one more thing thank to add thank you so much sir what well, that sir uh, <clears throat> when we are dealing with the nmo and because few med, med dmds which is very good for maybe good for the multiple sclerosis and maybe have hazards for the nmo patient so uh, making a surety when patient is presenting with optic neuritis whether he is nmo or uh, mog or purely a multiple sclerosis the moment you start with the patient with the dmds especially interferons may worsen the patient with nmo so we have to give this in mind also we move on to our second stage which is also very common that is idiopathic intracranial lesion uh, from the ophthalmological perspective discussion i am going to invite dr ganesh pillai to present his views from purely ophthalmological point of view and then from the neurosurgeon's point of view dr sudeep patel Yes, Dr. Ganesh. Yeah, good evening, uh, respected seniors and my dear colleague. Uh, it's an honor uh, to be sharing the webinar or dais in sense, uh, virtual dais with Dr. Rohit Saxena, sir. He's my teacher uh, and man, my mentor. Uh, he was my thesis guide also, and the topic was optic neuritis. Uh, so it's a surprise and a good surprise for me. Thank you so much. uh so we'll be discussing idiopathic intracranial uh, hypertension from an ophthalmological point of view uh basically i'll be sharing a case uh, sorry can you make it full screen yeah can you make it full screen please? yeah 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 it will be a case based discussion that i have uh, thought of so nowadays what is happening is post lockdown you are seeing more number of these ic uh, intracranial hypertension i am not sure uh, maybe too much of weight gain during lockdown is one of the reasons uh, probably neurologists can tell us better pro- because they see it more often than us i suppose so uh, this uh, 25 year old female came with history of headache and a transient obscuration of vision since one month she first noticed it while playing badminton and it was worse and bending down 
her mri was not suggestive of ms it was done outside uh, she had was consulted uh, uh, somewhere else she was diagnosed as optic neuritis uh, and was given pulse steroid with initial improvement of symptoms but on tapering of these steroids she had a recurrence so on examination her best corrected visual acuity was 6 by 6 there was no rapd slit lamp biomicroscopy there was no cells a color vision was normal there was no pain on movement in any direction movement were full uh, cornea lens were clear on fundus examination uh, uh, there was both eyes grade 3 papilledema uh, with obscuration of vessel while leaving the disc which we can see in this photograph there was toxicity of vessel blood pressure was normal uh, no peripheral lesion or any hemorrhage was seen on visual fields we can see there was enlargement of blind spot uh, i i did a 3d oct to look for the height of papilledema the photo may not be suggestive but on this 3d oct we can see uh, the uh, disc is grossly elevated oct rnfl and gcc was done it was also a uh, generalized thickening is noted uh, and it helps in actually uh, seeing the follow up of this patient So MRI and lumbar puncture is uh, a modality which uh, basically helps us in the diagnosis. MRI was reviewed, and uh, when we when we saw there was subtle changes uh, showing partial empty uh, cella and the perioptic uh, thickening was noted. Lumbar puncture was done with the opening pressure of 34 centimeter of water column, which is norm more than normal. CSF was sent for analysis, which was grossly normal. her bmi was 31 kg per meter square the final diagnosis of idiopathic intracranial hypertension was made uh, probably she had put down a lot of weight almost 10 kg in the last 6 months she had asked she was asked to reduce weight and exercise she was started on acetazolamide 250 mg which was uh, now it has been increased to qid along with sirpotlor review was done fortnightly at presentation uh, this was the picture and this is the 15 day picture that we can see now you can see the temporal uh, edema is reducing the, uh, so discussing idiopathic intracranial hypertension it was also known as zero tumor cerebri commonly called as benign intracranial hypertension uh, mainly seen in younger obese women the incidence is around 20 per lakh of the population Uh, and as more obese the person is the chances are higher in those people especially with the bmi of more than 40 uh, for clinching the diagnosis uh, lumbar puncture is there uh, and opening pressure of more than 200 mm of water in a non obese and more than 250 uh, in a obese patient is diagnostic modified dandy criteria guides us uh, in uh, uh, labeling it as uh, idiopathic intracranial hypertension signs and symptoms of increased intracranial pressure no other neurological abnormalities or impaired level of consciousness elevated csf opening pressure with normal csf composition a new imaging study that shows no etiology for increased icp and no other cause for intracranial hypertension is found so the pathophysiology is uh, uh, basically there is a change in the cerebral hemodynamics reduction of csf absorption decrease conductance to arachnoid granulation and transverse uh, sinus stenosis is frequently associated with uh, ich uh, symptoms normally the patient to us ophthalmologist presents with headache transient visual obscuration sometimes pulsatile tinnitus dizziness photophobia retrobulb pain visual loss and diplopia so uh, first uh, we grade the papilledema we have to look for the papilledema uh, this is a friesen modified friesen scale uh, grade 0 there is no papilledema uh, grade 1 there is uh, a c shaped halo around the disc uh, grade 2 that's a complete uh, uh, halo around the disc grade 3 we can see there is mild obscuration of the vessels while they are leaving the disc grade 4 there is uh, gross uh, at, uh, obscuration of vessels and grade five you cannot see any vessel at the disc so visual field changes which we look for is enlargement of blind spot blind spot is basically 7.5 degrees 
uh, uh, in size and uh, it is around 1.5 degrees uh, below the horizontal meridian. Now you can see the extension of blind spot over the horizontal meridian. Uh, inferonasal step is another characteristic feature which we can see in HPF in, uh, and generalized reduction is also noted sometimes. The visual field found in ICH uh, uh, are uh, basically optic related, disc related things where nerve fiber bundles damage at the level of optic disc. Delays in, uh, on angiography, we can see there is delay in pre-laminar arterial filling with, uh, uh, with this angiography, but uh, I have not done in this case because it's an invasive procedure and the lumbar puncture was diagnostic. Now, basically we have to di differentiate between the papilledema, optic neuritis and iron, which has already been discussed before. Uh, management wise, uh, we advise the patient to reduce the weight, 10 to 15 percent of the weight is a significant role in the management. Low sodium diet, BMI is monitored, CSF pressure is reduced up to 40 percent on 10 percent weight reduction. Uh, idiopathic intracranial hypertension treatment dial has uh, given us that acetazolamide uh, use in IIH improves the visual outcome. The beneficial effects of acetazolamide in the diet are both an independent factors and both help in uh, reducing this problem. Acetazolamide has a greater effect on a visual field function in the first month of escalating the doses. And the dose of acetazolamide can be increased up to 4 grams. So I started her on 250 milligrams PD, increase it to TDS, now on QID. There was no permanent morbidity or uh, mor uh, morbidity with acetazolamide. So is there any role of steroids in such patients? Because the patient has an initial improvement with steroids. Yes, occasionally it is used to treat IIH, but their mechanism of action is unclear. Uh, mainly uh, suggestive is acute infarction, which can be similar to an AIM, can be avoided with steroids. Usually recurrence is noted on taping of the steroids of papilid uh, in papilledema. So short-term use of steroids can be there in cases where there is uh, before the shunting procedure is to be done. The other drugs can also be used. Uh, we as ophthalmologists uh, don't use it. Uh, Topiramid and furosemide has been shown good effects in uh, idiopathic intracranial hypertension. So the, my take-home message uh, is that we have to differentiate between papilledema and papillitis, uh, looking at the color contrast uh, vision loss, pain associated with uh, it, and the, basically uh, these are the findings that you have to look for. Then fields can help in diagnosis, which is not often done. Again, we have to do it more often, fields. OCT, RFL, and 3D imaging can help in early subtle changes of disc edema. Early disc edema can be diagnosed with 3D when there is a confusion. Weight reduction has a significant benefit. Acetazolamide still remains now the mainstay of treatment. Uh, steroid short term can be used, but it should not be used uh, prolonged because it has its side effects eventually, and it can lead to uh, a more uh, non-treatment. Uh, 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 it may not respond to treatment after uh, the restapling of steroids. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Ganesh. Uh, I suppose uh, BIH now is not restricted to fatty females. Let's see uh, what Dr. Sunil Pandit says. Can I start sharing? Yes, you can start sharing. Uh, are you able to see? Yes, you can proceed. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me to this session. Uh, a very interesting and a short topic, basically in idiopathic intracranial hypertension. Earlier, it used to be known as uh, pseudo tumor cerebri. Uh, in an era where uh, papilledema usually meant brain tumor, so therefore, when people were surprised that uh, there is no tumor to be found was then renamed as pseudotumors. Uh, then came uh, another uh, name that is benign intracranial hypertension. 
unfortunately the word benign is a big misnomer it is absolutely not a benign disease it is quite a devastating disease to the patient now uh, as far as idiopathic intracranial hypertension is concerned the definitions by definition there should be clinically features of raised icp essentially normal imaging and exclusion of all other causes of raised intracranial pressure now these three things means that basically this is a diagnosis of exclusion and uh, now what happens with uh, patients with iih is that most often they come with headaches vomitings and blurred vision so either they will go to the ophthalmologist or they will go to the neurologist and uh, there should be a uh, communication with the to to come down to the diagnosis and basically try to exclude every other cause and then label the patient as uh, idiopathic intracranial hypertension now epidemiology yes uh, women are more common than in males women women with higher bmi it is much more common but then we have found that it doesn't matter there are, we have had uh, men we have had children with iih so it occurs in all age groups it does not necessarily limited to uh, elderly or middle aged females <coughs> so clinical features headache and vomiting yes uh, visual symptoms uh, sometimes patient may have a six now palsy which may be partial or complete other than that there will be a normal neurological examination there is no evidence of any neurological deficit so that is one very very important thing which needs to be emphasized that neurological examination is normal and patient has papilledema now there is a uh, small segment of iih which in which the patient does not have papilledema but still intracranial pressure is raised so uh, again we are not very sure really how to diagnose these uh, these patients uh, mri brain is one of the main investigations to be done unfortunately mri brain is usually normal uh, people will talk of subtle signs like the empty cell syndrome or uh, the dilatation of the optic nerve or sometimes you can even see fluid around the optic nerves but these are such small subtle signs that they are by and large missed out by everybody uh, it's only when the diagnosis is established and then you relook the scan and then you find that oh there was an empty cella or there was a suggestion that the cella appears <laughs> not a very clear cut uh, sign so as far as mri brain is concerned mri should be normal ophthalmologic examination uh dr rohit uh, emphasized and uh, um, girish also ganesh also emphasized that the first thing in opt ophthalmic examination which we as clinicians want is a visual field chart which is most commonly missed by ophthalmologists um, we as uh, neurologists get a good amount of patients with headaches to our clinics and almost all of them have visited some of them not just prior to coming to us and almost all of them do not have a visual field chart they have visual acuity charts they have been to stack glasses they have been to stack medications but a visual field charting is not done so uh, one very key message which i would like to uh, share with the panelists is that uh, if there is a patient with a headache and if the neurologist says that this mri is normal then go for a visual field chart you may miss several findings it is one now uh, what is csf pressure now csf pressure i think the ophthalmologists really don't need to know what to do uh, actually it is done by us or maybe by the anesthetist uh, basically what you do is you do a lumbar puncture and put uh, connect the lp needle to a pressure transducer and you can find out the pressure but uh, most often we do not have pressure transducers here so we do a jugard so i'll show you some pictures of a jugard basically what you do is 
that you put the patient in a lateral decubitus position and measure the height from the floor to the uh, point where the LP is to be done. Then you take a, oh, I'm sorry, yeah. Then you measure the same height on the IV stand. The same height is measuring on the IV stand. And at that point, you fix the IV, uh, fix a, a scale and connect an IV and connect it to the LP. And the pressure will start rising. You can see the pressure. It will take about 5 to 10 minutes for the pressure to stabilize. Normal intracranial pressure is around 100 to 150 centimeters of water. Anything above 200 or 250 is abnormal. We have seen pressures as high as more than 1000 millimeters on this scale. So it's a very simple and a very easy uh, test. It takes around 5 minutes to be done. Uh, what about the treatment options? Well, uh, Ganesh has already uh, enumerated carbonic anhydrase inhibitors and furosemide. Uh, surgery, one option for patients with IIH is surgery or CSF diversion procedures. There are basically two diversion procedures which used to be done. One was a direct optic nerve decompression in which the um, optic nerve sheath, there was a slit created between the optic nerve sheath so that CSF would uh, leak out from, the, uh, uh, from around the optic nerve and get absorbed in the periorbital pad. But uh, that has been almost completely given up and now we do lumboperitoneal shunts or ventriculoperitoneal shunts. Now, since the CS, since MRIs are normal, since the brain is normal, the ventricle is not elated. So it is uh, probably impossible to do a ventriculoperitoneal shunt. It's far more easier to do a lumboperitoneal shunt. And uh, by and large, that has now become the mainstay of treatment for this patients. Now, um, there are, there is a group of patients in which, uh, what, uh, however much medications you give, uh, the patient's vision continues to deteriorate. And in those patients, an urgent surgery is a must for uh, such patients. For other patients, one can follow up with uh, medications and with regular uh, ophthalmological checkups. And if required, then surgical treatment is a good option. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir, uh, for uh, your short and sweet presentation. I want to ask, when do you prescribe uh, surgery? Like, uh, when a uh, person should go for a surgery and uh, how long we can uh, keep the patients on acetazolamide? Because one of my patients, she is a young girl and she has been taking uh, acetazolamide from three years. Probably she's getting depression because of acetazolamide. So we have to keep, though her vision uh, feels and everything is stable, but still she's on acetazolamide by neurologist. So how long we can give acetazolamide? Okay. The first thing is, uh, uh, <clears throat> as I told you, if the vision is deteriorating, or if the patient has already presented with extreme deterioration of vision, then uh, one should consider a surgical option. One should not wait for patient to go in for a weight loss or acetazolamide. Second thing is that acetazolamide itself is not a very uh, comfortable drug. A lot of patients have uh, side effects to acetazolamide. In fact, uh, there are some reports that almost 40% uh, of patients do not tolerate a high dose of acetazolamide. So, uh, in those patients, the surgical option should be considered. Uh, there are, there were a few reports earlier that uh, over a period of time, the effectiveness of acetazolamide will come down, will reduce. So, you have to keep on stepping up the dose. But uh, um, there is no such defined time limit as to how long you can give acetazolamide. Uh, however, uh, if the patient is continuously on medication for three years, probably what one could do is to reduce the dose and uh, see what is the effect and uh, gradually taper and stop. If, uh, if the eyesight worsens, then go in for a LP shine. Exactly. I, I just love, would like to add, I missed out on uh, optic nerve head fenestration, which 
Dr. Rohit Saxena sir does, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, probably is one of the methods of uh, not not very much, but sir probably would be able to tell us more about it. Yeah. So, uh, unfortunately, I would say we are doing a lot of optic nerve sheath fenestration. In fact, uh, we uh, unfortunately it's become such a restful from neurology to us that uh, we feel that they're not even. Uh, giving medical management an adequate try, but I would just tend to defer that um, uh, ONSF now is a very very simple. Uh, it's it's like any squint surgery. It takes about ten to fifteen minutes. We just disinsert the medial rectus for ophthalmologist. I'm telling that we just disinsert the medial rectus. We're able to reach up to the uh, optic nerve sheath. We use a keratome and we make a window and cut the snippet out. So it's about ten to fifteen minute procedure, and we are doing a lot of optic nerve sheath penetrations. Now almost I would say about once a fortnight is what our interventions are. So we tend to, uh, with our neurologist, whenever we are working, uh, we tend to be relatively more aggressive on acetazolamide, at least for initial treatment. I would agree that we don't want to continue acetazolamide for too long, either uh, uh, because the disease is supposed to be self-limiting. By three to six months, we start discussing with the patient and the neurologist about tapering the dose of acetazolamide gradually. And if it recurs, then of course, step up and think surgery. But if there is severe visual loss or on maximum tolerated medication, acetazolamide and or topiramate, if there is, uh, and of course, weight loss, which is effective, but we all know it is very, very difficult to do. So if there is still weight option loss, if it's significant vision loss, we tend to prefer to go for optic nerve sheath penetration as the first procedure. If headaches or the CSF pressure is very high, uh, and we've had patients who in whom it was like, you know, 600 or 800, which I believe it's not measurable or something. But if it's very, very high, then obviously an optic nerve sheath penetration. So we've had patients who presented with acute vision loss and who had very, very high 600 plus uh, CSF pressure. So there, of course, an urgent uh, neurosurgical intervention, LP shunt, that was uh, discussed by Dr. Pandit is, is the key. So I would say that we tend to do a little more uh, medical intervention and then, of course, ONSFs are a little more uh, because uh, we find them to be very effective. And the good thing is that you do one eye and you get results in both the eyes. So visual field gets cleared in the other eye also. So we operate the worst eye as our primary intervention. So, uh, and the other key thing is, if you have a patient who is not what you classically started off with, a young female, you uh, look for, you, you require an MRV also. So, uh, 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 venous sinus thrombosis is something that is very, very common, and it is a must investigation to do. So, MRI plus MRV is very, very important. Do a complete workup to look for risk factors. So ladies may be on OCs. We've had a lady who came to us with severe papilledema who was on recurrent morning after pills. So she used to take them every few days, which I believe have very high levels of estrogen progesterone. So that is the other thing. Of course, vitamin A and all is not something we've seen frequently, even antibiotics, but a complete medical history and complete systemic history, anemia, sleep apnea, these are some uh, associations that must be ruled out. So, beside drug therapy, weight loss, rule out risk factors, and of course, uh, uh, venous sinus thrombosis, and then think of management uh, based on what has been discussed. Can I just... We have seen uh, medical students who have operated in emergency. Dinita, can I add something? Yes, sir. Uh, one of the things is that, uh, as Dr. Rohit said, the MRV, uh, venous sinus thrombosis. Now, if there is a venous sinus thrombosis, there is a venous sinus thrombosis. It is not IIH. True. That True. Is one. The second thing is that there is an entity which is, which is called as venous sinus stenosis or transverse mm -hmm. sinus stenosis. Now, the big problem with transverse sinus stenosis is that both the transverse sinuses are not of a uniform diameter in all patients. There are patients who have a, uh, a slightly smaller sinus. There are patients who have uh, complete uh, absence of a sinus on one side. So we are not really very sure whether this really is an entity or not. And when this entity came into being, when this sinus came into being, there were 
surgical procedures uh, yeah. for stenting of the sinuses, which were started earlier and um, which have uh, been practically abandoned by now. So I don't think this uh, sinus thrombosis thing really comes is in the picture as of now. Just I I want to add something. Yeah. Uh, sir, is uh, Dr. Pandit is very correct. But uh, we sometimes intervene with major transistenosis pressure gradient. And if transistenosis pressure gradient is more than 10, although it is not being done in uh, our area, or I don't think AMS or PGI is doing, I don't remember. But if transistenosis pressure gradient is more than 10, then it suggests it may be uh, IIH. And then stenosis works blindly because unfortunately or fortunately the transverse sinus crosses uh, towards the bony, bony part. So the pressure is increased, then there is uh, uh, radiological mimicking of stenosis. So if pressure gradient is different uh, uh, in the stenosis, stenosis part, then intervention can be done. If it is uh, not different, then intervention should not be done. And it works. Another issue is that the number peritoneal and 50% are having uh, complications about uh, for revision. So ultimately, medical management, I believe, as, as Dr. Rohit also said, aggressive medical management should be tried unless patient is having fulminant uh, IIH and uh, very rapid progressive. And we also used to do the same practice. If headache is not present, I think uh, uh, optic nerve fenestration will be safer than uh, uh, LP uh, shunt or VP shunt is difficult although. So if headache is, headache is there or very high pressure, then we can go for LP shunt. Otherwise, yeah, medical management is very important. Dr. Nitin, you want to say something? No, I think mostly the points are covered. It is just that uh, missing out on some treatable cause, like as Dr. Witt mentioned, sinus thrombosis, because many of these are females and uh, a simple MRI may miss out. And uh, though we may label it as idiopathic, eventually the cause could have been a sinus thrombosis. So, such patients, we definitely need to be sure that uh, there is no sinus or cortical thrombosis. And I think treatment guideline has been discussed very precisely. And uh, I think optic nerve fenestration, uh, I mean, we are more biased towards education, maybe because uh, we find it very easy to do. It takes short time. And uh, the complication is not 50%. The so, uh, <laughs> so it's manageable. I mean, uh, we have young patients, uh, obese patients, they tolerate it very well and the results are good. So we should do what is comfortable in our own setup practically, and uh, but we should not miss the diagnosis. Being a physician, one point I want to add, secondary cause you right atrial pressure or right ventricular pressure or superior vena cava syndrome, these may be cause of uh, so-called so -called IH. So we are seeing above this place and we are missing it below. So these things should also be taken care if we are talking of a, a so-called IIH. So we get all the patients from our neurophysician. So we presume they have evaluated properly. <laughs> <laughs> can I, that is why Dr. Sneep said that we have to rule out all causes before saying it, it is idiopathic. Yeah. Dr. Roy, you wanted to say something? Yeah, I want to add some two points. One is that CSF drainage, you know, removing 20, 25 ml of CSF is an immediate and highly effective treatment of IIH. So mm. when we do a lumbar puncture, we remove the CSF. And number two, I want to say it's a very severe disease with very serious consequences and because it involves both the eyes and we really do not know the CNS, CNS hydrodynamics, you know. Close observation and repeating a CSF, maybe after a few days, may be very, very important. And of course, visual field charting and patients report. And we should be, we should be uh, aggressive in treating IIH. You know, it involves both the eyes. Me, Dr. Uh, and Dr. Nitin Garg and Dr. Amani, we have one that medical student, you know, who could not recover. Despite Dr. Garg doing yes, a lumbar so puncture right on the Sunday afternoon. Yeah. You could hear me? Yes, sir. Yeah. And the third thing is headache, you know. Sometimes these patients, even when the I the integral pressure is controlled, the headache continues, which may not be directly related to IIH. And in these patients, polydopiramate may is very helpful to and they should be treated as per their phenotype, you know, migraineous type 
और टेंशन टाइप है दैट्स दैट्स व्हाट आई वांट टू आइडिया जस्ट वन मोर पॉइंट सम सम पेशेंट्स दे रिस्पोंड वेरी वेल टू एसिटाजोलामाइड बट वंस द ड्रग इज स्टॉप्ड दे डू हैव अ रिपीट elevation of intracranial pressure with papilledema and sometimes then the neurologist and ophthalmologist are in a dilemmatic situation whether to continue for treatment because the patient is responding to acetazolamide and though the patient has been using it say 6 months uh, then whether to go for early surgery or to still continue for treatment i think to explore options you will be Six months on treatment would uh, warrant a sarul kudar. Hello. So I think we can move on to our third topic, uh, that is intracranial space occupying lesions. uh dr vivek som from the ophthalmological perspective dr vivek can you share your screen please a very good evening the seniors and uh, thank you uh, bdos for giving me this opportunity to speak can you see ma'am the slides yes 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 okay. yes so you okay. can continue so it's a very big topic and uh, i would rather uh, make it small i made a big presentation and i would rather talk about only the ophthalmologist point of view where does the ophthalmologist fit in basically ophthalmologist might be the first point of contact for such patients and accepting ophthalmic complaints and and diagnosing uh, intracranial space occupying lesion is of paramount importance for the patient sometimes the patients are referred by neurosurgeon the neurophysicians and even pediatricians for evaluation of fundus and many a times the ophthalmologist is the one who diagnoses you know uh, these kind of suspicious cases okay so i'll start with uh, two cases which i saw recently in last 7 8 days only first was a 46 year old male referred from the periphery uh, he had Of, uh, in the right eye of the visual yeah. field for approximately three months, he had no history of headache, redness, pain, trauma, no chronic uh, illness, medication or addictions. At presentation, his visual acuity, best corrected visual acuity in right eye was six by twenty four, and left eye was six by six nylons, and he had relative afferent pupillary defect in right eye, and rest of findings were normal. On doing his fundus evaluation, uh, he had a disc in the right eye. and in the left eye there was a significant temporal pallor and there was something very interesting that he had uh, these choroidal uh, folds and striae and on his ocd there was a hum you know convexity on on the ocd so we get a diagnosis of optic glioma um, maybe uh, intracranial space occupying uh, you know compressive lesion in the brain and optic retrobulbar neuritis we did a visual field and we could see that he had um, you know uh, visual fields which was suggestive of pituitary and uh, which was non congruous but it was uh, more on the right side and than the left side on doing his mri a macro large macro adenoma of the pituitary was diagnosed just two big days back a 18 year old male came was referred from by the rmo of the medicine department for evaluation of diminution of vision and headache the patient presented with headache progressive diminution of vision and deviation of left eye since one month there was no history of nausea vomiting weakness of uh, limbs or anything no history of acute or chronic illness or medication trauma 
there was no significant other any other significant history on examination his best cricket visual acuity in right eye was 69 and left eye was 6 by 18 and his segment was normal except for almost non reacting pupil left eye was afferent pupillary defect and right eye was having a sluggish very sluggish reaction to light so on evaluating he had a restriction of ocular movements uh, or rather third nerve palsy in the right eye and his uh, fundus picture showed papillary edema which was slightly asymmetrical uh, in the sense that his right eye was more hyperemic than the left eye and uh, i just got his report uh, today evening and he was diagnosed to have uh, only the mri showed that a neoplastic mass in the pineal region query pineal germinoma compressing a tectal plate leading to obstructive hydrocephalus and periventricular ooze so uh, you know ophthalmologist many a times are the first person who diagnose these kind of uh, patients so um, intracranial space occupying lesions can be of various types and and there is a wide variety and to discuss them all in a short presentation is not possible but they can be broadly seen as primary brain tumors metastatic lesions uh, cerebral abscess tuberculosis neurocystis scoliosis phacomatosis and hematomas the intracranial tumors uh, basically in this we have to remember that primary intracranial tumors are less common than the secondary and they can and they both have basically uh, common clinical features of space occupying lesions except that the metastatic tumors may have additional general constitutional symptoms like as seen in retinoblastoma lung breast thyroid uh, germ, germ cell malignancies or phacomatosis so papillary edema in visual fields uh, depending on the site or the location of the tumor varies in most of the things most of the patients basically it depends on where in the brain is the tumor for example for, uh, frontal lobe tumors will have changes in brain function weakness of the opposite side which will apart from these these features would be apart from the papillary edema and other features so there may be personality change and a very typical foster kennedy syndrome in which the patient has optic atrophy on one side and papillary edema on the other side so once we see an foster kennedy syndrome and we find some kind of a history of personality change change in speech and smell we can think of frontal lobe tumors similarly temporal tumors will have quadrantinopia along with visual hallucinations which will be more prominent main wall third now so parietal lobe tumors will have odontinopia associated with visual and auditory hallucinations and abnormal optokinetic response tumors of the ophthalmic occipital lobes basically have a varied picture depending on which part of the occipital lobe is involved and can have a crescentic loss in the periphery or may have a quadrantic or hemianopic um, you know field defect which might be sparing or involving the fixation tumors of the mid brain uh, they have a huge variation depending on where the tumor is there in the upper part you know and collicula in mid brain may have ptosis conjugate movement also conjugate movement light near dissociation in the mid part you have weber syndrome and benedict syndrome which have characteristic hemiplegia and jerky movements uh, tremors and jerky movements um, uh, respectively in the pons you have a uh, feature upper pons third nerve palsy hemiplegias and facial nerve uh, facial palsy of upper motor neuron type lower pons uh, when involved may have miller gubler syndrome or foveal syndrome they also may have involvement of fifth nerve which is of big significance to ophthalmologists because fifth nerve along with facial palsy is going to predispose the patient to neurotopic and neuroparalytic keratitis this might also be associated with um deafness and gaze palsy so all these ophthalmic features may point towards the localizing signs you know where the tumor might be located along with the uh signs of raised intracranial pressure and papillary edema tumors of the auditory nerve may have corneal anesthesia tinnitus deafness nystagmus six nerve is usually involved in in the tumors of auditory nerve and facial paralysis may be present tumors of the cerebellum are characterized by marked papillary edema associated with nystagmus so interpreting primary ophthalmic signs is is of uh, great significance
because in many of the patients are simple complaints like headache, blurred vision, progressive diminution of vision, deviation of idiopia, occasional, occasionally restricted field, head tilt. So we have to have a high degree of suspicion at the outset and, and spare a little bit time on examining and taking careful history regarding the headache, which might be, you know, uh, associated or precipitated by sneezing, straining, coughing, or when recumbent may have focal or non-focal neurological deficits uh, like uh, headache, vomit associated with vomiting, dizziness, convulsions, an alteration in pulse, pulse BPN, uh, respiratory rhythm, may have ocular paresis, heat effects, and acute stroke-like system symptoms, convulsions, scissors, and behavioral changes. So we can spare a little bit more time in patients with headache and, and field, you know, accompanying of field changes. Careful examination, uh, we should, you know, give special, uh, uh, you know, uh, attention to head tilt. Pupil many a times holds the uh, key to the diagnosis along with the disc edema. Papillary edema, though, may be variable in severity and duration. Severe pap papillary edema is usually seen in pre-central, temporous, synodal, ophthalmic, thalamus, midbrain, cerebellar, and extracerebellar. Whereas maybe moderate or short duration in post-central, there may be no papillary and tumors of pons, central white matter, and pituitary tumors. So these will present different, differently. Foster Kennedy syndrome is usually seen in patients with frontal tumor. Paralysis of ocular muscle, except for lateral rectus, paralysis of other ocular muscles as a non-specific sign of raised intracranial pressure is rare. So cursory relevant general examination should also be performed by ophthalmologist so that they can change, they can actually have a suspicion in the direction of um, you know, patients having intracranial tumors. Behavioral changes may be present along with the ophthalmic findings, especially in gliomas. Tumors may be seen in thyroid, breast, bones, or the patient might complain of one of them. Facial palsy may be associated. Deafness, tremors in hand, jerky movements, hemiparesis, fevers in signs in cases of brain abscess, signs of septicemia may be seen in cases of brain abscess. Relevant special, special investigation should be done from ophthalmologist's point of view. Most of the times, uh, the patients can be caught by visual field assessment, or you can have a great degree of suspicion uh, at the level of visual field assessment. And in association with the neurologist, you can, or neurosurgeon, you can do a VEP, CT scan, or MRI, MR angiography, or MR venography, whatever is required, you know, because it should not be done repeatedly. Once I get it done, and then the neurologist wants an MR angiography. So you can coordinate with the neurologist to get a better investigation modality at the first go only. So the take-home message is very simple. Careful history taking is of paramount importance in all the cases. Careful ophthalmic examination. Many times the pupil and optic nerve may hold the key to the diagnosis. Cursory relevant general examination also helps. And when ophthalmic signs don't get correlate, take an effort to review the history with relevant leading questions and timely neurological reference might save the life of people and also disabilities in people. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Vivek Som, for uh, such an excellent presentation. And it becomes much easier to say refer to neurosurgeons. So now we will uh, listen to Dr. Ritin Gurk, sir, for uh, neurosurgical point of view in intracranial space of defined lesions. Yeah, am I audible now? Yes, am I? you can go okay. ahead. Yeah. So thank you, uh, Bhopal Ophthalmic Society and Dr. Ramani Manav for uh, inviting me. And uh, it's a very uh, good talk, uh, top topic actually, neuroophthalmology. But I feel as Dr. Pandit sir said uh, that uh, many times uh, things do get significantly missed. And as a perspective, see, for a neurosurgeon, it's very simple. If there's an intracranial space occupying lesion, you need to get it out. So we all know the Monroe-Kelly hypothesis that there is a dynamic balance maintained between 
the brain, uh, the uh, blood and the CSF because skull is a closed compartment and whenever there is a mass lesion which appears, it does have an effect on the other three and what we worry more is about the brain. And we know that uh, second nerve is the only nerve wherein there is a continuation uh, with the brain. The CSF goes all around it. So therefore, uh, it is prone for the pressure effects and uh, that is why we call it as a window to the brain. It's an extension of the white matter tracks. So, so therefore, uh, optic nerve evaluation is very essential and uh, especially for the mass lesions. Now, from a perspective, I would uh, say that uh, there are grossly two different types. Uh, so, one is wherein we have a generalized raised ICP and this could be due to large tumors, it could be due to hydrocephalus or it could be due to an infective etiology such as tuberculomas or tuberculum meningitis. And uh, these patients predominantly have associated symptoms. They would have headache, they may have some focal neurological findings, they may have uh, seizures. So these are not uh, very often missed actually. Uh, they more, more often come to a neurologist uh, primarily. And if then we go back and evaluate it, we find that there is either a papillary edema or if they come very late, there could also be a secondary optic atrophy. Now, the, these are the group of patients wherein they do not come to a neurologist. And these are the tumors which cause a direct pressure on the optic pathway. It could be the optic nerve, opticism, or retrochiasmal. And these are tumors which are primarily in the center of the supracellular region. And these are the ones wherein I think as a team, a neurosurgeon and ophthalmolo uh, ophthalmologist should work. Uh, just one second. I'm sorry, my dog is fast. So, so this is where the, uh, the ophthalmologist and the neurosurgeon should sort of have a protocol uh, of evaluating such patients. And uh, this is where uh, the ophthalmologist should have a protocolized uh, evaluation because the first time is the most important time to pick up uh, a disease because they do not present with uh, any neurological symptoms. They do not have headaches. They don't, ha don't have seizures. They'll just come with subtle complaints that my vision is blurring slowly. They will never say that I have a field deficit or uh, that my one eye is gone. So there will be very subtle symptoms uh, and it is only on evaluation. Uh, one second. Renuka. And uh, it's only on evaluation uh, as we have seen in a lot of slides. It is the fundus evaluation, the field evaluation that we can pick up really early. And unfortunately, we still do get a lot of patients coming from various uh, ophthalmologists with a long history of one year, two year. We recently operated a teacher wherein only thing which was left was getting an imaging done. So this is the second and this is the most important from a perspective of neurosurgeon that the ophthalmologist should uh, lay stress on neuroophthalmology. And uh, if a patient is coming again and again, probably this point should be addressed. And finally, third part is the congenital brain tumor syndromes like uh, VHL syndrome or tuberous sclerosis. So the direct compressions, uh, we, I've discussed this, uh, they do not have typical raised ICP. They have a progressive and a gradual history. And uh, therefore, a protocolized ophthalmic evaluation is very, very essential. And uh, I'm sure in those centers which have a dedicated neurosurgical facility, uh, the ophthalmologists uh, get more uh, tuned to doing these evaluations de in detail. And that's what we follow with Madam at our center, that uh, even if a patient has uh, some mild symptoms, mild headache, uh, all the things are done at the first visit. And to be frank, it really doesn't cost much. Uh, if we convince the patient uh, that, look, this is important as a part of assessment, uh, it should be done. So I'll just highlight a few cases. And this is just to bring to perspective whatever we have been discussing. Now, this was a young patient, around 35-year-old, uh, progressive headaches, and as Dr. So mentioned, cognitive changes, and uh, slowly progressive visual impairment. So we can see it's a large uh, meningioma, olfactory groove meningioma. There is hyperostosis of the bone. And... Uh, we can see there is so much pressure, there is so much mass effect. And just want to highlight here, we can see that already the tumor is starting here. This is the nerve which is going here. So apart from the direct compression on the nerve, there is also a raised ICP because of the mass lesion. 
and because these symptoms these these meningiomas are very slow growing uh, probably the patient is not in a position to pick up a one sided visual impairment uh, till the time it comes too late so he came with a, to us and by the time he came unfortunately he came to op he had impaired vision but as happens they delayed surgery and then he came blind in both eyes uh, with a significant drowsy state and we had to operate him in emergency unfortunately his vision has not recovered so this is a post op scan so this is one uh, important uh, type of tumor and just to show in drop rate video you can see how significantly stretched. this is the optic nerve this is the olfactory nerve so this is the front uh, this is the left side this is the right side and this is the supracellar area this is the tumor and i just wanted to show how thinned out white parts like this nerve is so we can imagine the amount of resilience this nerve would have had and the tumor increased uh, and and he the tumor must have been increasing for such a long time to have reached this stage uh this was the field as we know in one eye and uh, the other eye also was significantly impaired and uh, so that was one case the second case is again uh, seen very often uh, pituitary macroadenomas uh, again they many times are non functioning predominantly are non functioning adenomas so they really get picked up only when the patient has a visual complaint headache may be there only when there is apoplexy which is not so often so a very um, easy to operate you go into nasally and take it out and we can see the optic apparatus nicely uh, eased out same here on the coronal the amount of stretch on this optic chiasm and oh, post operatively the optic apparatus settles down and uh, this is just few operative images so this is the floor of the cella we are removing piecemeal it is endonasal nowadays almost all surgeons do it endonasally uh this is the bulging uh, cella the dura is intact and we can see the pressure amount of pressure here and once you open the dura and take out the tumor a very nicely prolapsed arachnoid uh, which is uh, which basically is evidence that the optic apparatus has been adequately decompressed this is another case uh, a separate case i have not put up the images just to highlight uh, that pituitary is an extra arachnoid disease so you don't open the arachnoid but this was a craniopharyngeoma uh, most of the craniopharyngeomas are done transcranially but there are some craniopharyngeomas which can be done endonasally predominantly if they are in the cella supracellar area now again endonasally we can see the medial optico carotid recess the optic nerve here and uh, the opening of the uh, the bony work is slightly more once you open the dura you have a solid tissue here and uh, once you start removing the tissue these are the, this is the ica the aca the nca seen here uh, this is now we are intradural intra arachnoid because craniopharyngeoma is a, actually an intracranial tumor and once you remove the solid part the optic apparatus is uh, relaxed and then you do a, a repair of the cella uh, but having said that uh, i we have found that unless patient comes with an rapd and complete loss of vision even if the vision is very critical or fields are advanced they do have significant improvement i mean this is a pre operative uh, scan this is not of the craniopharyngeoma it is of the pituitary adenoma and within 3 months we can see significant improvement in the fields this is very important again another patient uh, with almost a significant visual loss but we can see if we can see the dates uh, there is significant improvement so we cannot lose hope in these patients and we need to offer them surgery of course they always ask us sir is there a guarantee we need to tell look if you don't do this obviously a guarantee you won't recover but we can try and uh, these are this another patient we can see slightly asymmetric field loss uh, field loss but uh, more on one side than the other side and you can see in post op significant improvement so in our experience uh, cellar supracellular lesions especially pituitary adenomas have very good recovery from the vision now i come to a, a patient to a tumor which is not in the cella supracellular which basically causes raised icp a young boy 8 year old with a posterior fossa mass with significant hydrocephalus we can see very angry looking temporal horns and frontal horns so again this child was having persistent headache but you see sometimes the parents are not aware even their physicians are not aware and uh, he came to us mainly with visual impairment when he when the parents said that he is not able to uh, he is hitting obstacles while he is walking 
and the reason was obviously the hydrocephalus which was causing so post operatively there is a resolution of hydrocephalus once the tumors are tumor is out and you can see that uh, pre operatively there is significant papillary edema but post operatively there is significant resolution of the papillary edema so again timely timely intervention is very essential in these patients now i come to a vhl syndrome uh, we don't see this very often most of the hemangioblastomas are solitary hemangioblastomas uh, but we do come across sometimes occasional patients who do have uh, uh, syndromic hemangioblastomas so this patient uh, was actually a very interesting case uh, four years back we had operated for a solid hemangioblastoma here and then uh, everything was fine follow up was for one year uh, and then subsequently she came again uh, and then was found to have a new hemangioblastoma so these first three images are the first time and then she had another hemangioblastoma and then another nodule here and then a craniospinal screening showed multiple small nodules in the uh, cervical and the dorsal cord and then of ophthalmic evaluation showed on one side significant involvement so this this is again important so that uh, we counseled the family and uh, we went back and we asked that his grandfather had uh, died of some uh, neural problem of course it was not diagnosed at that time and uh, now there are special tumor clinics which do genetic counseling because they are worried that once they get married uh, whether it will get passed on to the next generation uh this is another case uh, she was a uh, daughter of uh, doctor in our hospital and uh, preparing for her 10th standard studying hard and she came with history of some blurring of vision no significant headache and uh, this is where the ophthalmologist uh, role is very important uh, she came to madam and madam as a routine workup did a complete workup and found significant papillary edema immediately mri was done and which showed that there are significant uh, coalescing lesions which basically turned out to be tuberculomas a simple shunt was done for her because uh, this radiologically looked very much like tuberculoma started on att and it's been now almost one year her disease is resolved vision is normal fundus is absolutely fine uh, another patient uh, with the mass lesion i don't have her images but just to highlight that significant edema papillary edema and uh, diagnosed treated uh, resolved but i felt that there is some optic atrophy also settling here so to conclude uh, there should be a protocol as a neurosurgeon we feel that uh, the ophthalmologist should have a protocol for a complete visual evaluation and if there is any doubt brain imaging should be done it's available now in most of the cities including tier 2 and tier 3 cities and it doesn't cost much and of course timely surgical excision of these tumors is very essential and the visual outcome depends upon the extent of visual loss at the diagnosis and treatment and in majority in our experience the outcomes are better if they are intervened timely thank you thank you dr nitin um, once i started working in a multi speciality now i understand the importance because there are lot of patients who require an early intervention there was a patient she was zooming around with ophthalmologist and somebody sent her to a psychiatrist saying that ki there is no problem but on mri she found to be a pituitary tumor so we have to be very careful when we uh, say something to the patients we need full evaluation before uh, saying somebody uh, any conclusive diagnosis thank you so much all uh, all the uh, speakers now the topic is open for discussion on uh, this uh, tumors if somebody wants to add on something being a physician i want to add something so being a physician yes. one thing was missed i with p tumor so i would like to address i with tumor like lesion also so sometime demyelinating lesion may present as a tumor like lesion so that part should also be considered and a good mri good quality mri gives us very good and good neurosurgeons are also sometimes say that no it doesn't appear as a tumor and many times it is so you try to work up with demyelinating lesions 
So eye with uh, tumor, we would also like to include eye with tumor like lesion, like a uh, big uh, demyelinating lesion. One patient, I must say, NMO, uh, NMO spectrum, within three, four days, she developed such a large spinal lesion and, and con consulted to many per uh, persons also. But her clinical feature within three, four days, such a body paresis was very difficult to explain with tumor. And at that time, I was not involved. And then NMO came out to be positive later on with the steroids. She improved. She is still in our follow-up. So sometimes a demyelinating lesion are really confusing. So clinic, clinicians and clinical sense is very important sometimes to uh, diagnose them. And obviously, neuroradiology helps us a lot. Yes, thank you, sir. Now we have reached to our last presentation by Clinical Secretary, Dr. Chavit Singh Bindra. He will be presenting few important cases in neuro uh, Thank you, Vinita ma'am, for giving me this opportunity. There has been many cases which we have already discussed today. I'll be sharing few of those. Uh, this, I'm presenting interesting neuro cases. I have two cases to present. This is a 52-year-old female who came with sudden onset binocular diplopia, more in left gaze since seven days. And uh, there was a history of hypertension since five years under treatment. There was no history of other comorbid condition. On evaluation, there was restricted abduction in the left eye on levoversion. The rest of the days were normal with no evidence of papilledema. On MR angiography, the aneurysm was re revealed. There was focal medial outpouching arising from cavernous segment of left ICA, and it was a secular aneurysm. The case two was a 40-year-old male who came with sudden onset binocular diplopia, more in right gaze since three weeks. There was no history of other comorbid condition with restricted abduction in the right eye on dextroversion. The other examination findings were normal. We could see in the first frame the scan again was done, and as has been pointed out earlier, we often see these hidden tumors in the right cavernous lesion. Now, this was a case three, 62-year-old male, presenting with sudden onset binocular diplopia, more in left gaze since seven days. There was history of hypertension, dyslipidemia, and diabetic and diabetes since 15 years. On evaluation, there was restricted adduction in the right eye on evaluation. There was no other finding. The pupillary reaction were normal. There was no ptosis. There was no other third nerve involvement. On evaluation, there were chronic lacunar infarct, which was noted in the right lentiform nucleus. The patchy inter hyper intensity, intensity noted in left centrum semi ovale left corona radiata, and deep ventricular white matter. The patient was diagnosed as CVA by a neurologist and was started on treatment. The patient's symptoms and diplopia, it resolved on treatment. Now, this was an interesting case. Uh, a patient of 65-year-old age came with complaints of diminution of vision in both eyes since 10 days. There was history of hypertension and diabetes mellitus since 20 years. On evaluation, there was restricted superior gaze in both eyes on supraversion along with lid retraction, which was suggestive of dorsal midbrain syndrome. The pupillary reaction was also sluggish. The fundus photography showed papilledema in both eyes with splinter hemorrhages. Also, the patient had moderate NPDR. The MRI scan showed subacute right parieto-occipital bleed with mass effect, with secondary in raised intracranial pressure. Now, this was a case five of 75 year old male who came with headache and loss of vision in both eyes since one month. The patient was a smoker, tobacco chewer since very long, with history of hypertension and diabetes mellitus of more than 20 years. The BCVA was hand movement in both eyes. On fundus evaluation, pallid optic disc edema was observed involving both eyes. The ocular movements were full with no history of diplopia. The angiography was done and we could see the disc leakage in the late phases. In MR venogram, the cerebral venous sinus thrombosis was seen involving all these sinuses. The patient was taken out of the treatment immediately. This is a case six of 53 year old female with complaints of diminution of vision since 25 days. The patient was on anti treatment for bone TB since eight months. The BCPA in the right eye was 6 by 60, and in the left eye was 260. 
on evaluation anterior segment and fundus was normal there was no rapd seen and the pupil were reacting to light the mri and mra was normal the rna it showed thickening uh, more on the nasal aspect the retroperitoneal optic neuritis is the most important potential side effect of ethambutol with involvement of either axial and less commonly periaxial fibers also mitochondrial dysfunction leading to optic neuropathies is getting recognized a lot more the patient gcpl was also done and we could see the ganglion cell complex thinning which was more in the nasal area the patient was treated for the same the ethambutol was stopped though the inh was continued in this case and the other supplements were given after 6 weeks the bcv in the right eye improved to 636 and in the left eye improved to 6360 the rnfl thinning was seen in the temporal area in the left eye and the thickness was reduced the gcc study it revealed progressive thinning though the visual acuity was increased again a similar kind of case where a 52 year old male was under was on att since 8 months for pulmonary tuberculosis the patient developed paresthesia in both feet since 5 months there was diminution of vision in both eyes since 6 weeks the best corrective visual acuity in the right eye was 560 and in the left eye was 3 by 60 the mri and mri was normal the serum as was also normal when the patient was subjected to rnfl oct rnfl it revealed increased rnfl thickness more in the right eye and the thickness was seen more in the temporal and the inferior quadrant also the ganglion cell complex layer is showed thinning which was seen more in the nasal area in this case also the thambutol was stopped and the treatment was started after 3 months the bcv it improved drastically in the right eye to 69 and left eye it improved to 612 the rnfl thickness reduced and tcc thinning was increased so we are now seeing such kind of cases very frequently of ethambutol toxicity now this is one of the case case 8 of 30 year old male who came with chief complaints of diminution of vision in both eyes since 20 days there was history of excessive alcohol intake since last 1 to 2 months there was no other comorbid condition or trauma the best corrective visual acuity in both eyes was 618 on evaluation anterior segment was normal reaction was normal and the fundus photography and oct also didn't show much changes apart from temporal pilar of disc the mri and mri showed nothing the visual fields were also normal with no scotomas on oct rnfl the temporal pilar was confirmed in the temporal area the patient was started treatment for alcohol associated toxic optic neuropathy now this modality ganglion cell complex now has now we can assess these kind of changes much earlier as compared to rnfl where we see thinning more in the nasal area which which gives us a suspicion that papillomacular bundles are involved more or the cone cells are involved more as compared to the other areas to conclude we again as rightly said by dr vivek som sir we have to be suspicious in all cases presenting with neuroophthalmic signs and symptoms appropriate neuroimaging is essential segregating conditions requiring additional angiography or venography is mandatory fundus photography oct with both rnfl and gcc fundus fluorescent angiography visual evo potential and visual field analysis can be used to record supplement and confirm clinical findings and to assess the prognosis of the condition the timely reference and working in tandem with your neurologist or neurosurgeon can salvage life thank you thank you chavi for uh, such a wonderful collection of uh, cases and optic now being the most sensitive part of uh, our body uh, it has to be given due attention with the help of funders and fields dr rohit you want to say something no excellent cases i think the whole uh, webinar has been very interesting and uh, excellent cases in the end with uh, perfect points i mean the key thing is uh, from an ophthalmologist perspective eye index of suspicion 
chair time essentially spending time with the patient on history and examination that is very very key so that you can understand international to lete hain india mein to fever hota to hata dete the sir i have one madam one question uh yes sir yeah with this uh, uh change in the att regimen i mean previously it was uh, two drugs uh, for after three months now it's three drugs so how frequently are you seeing because we have seen in the last uh, eight months almost of the pandotol toxicity very different from the cbt yeah you will dr chavla can you mute yourself please dr chavla you have to keep you ओके appalled but yes it was most unfortunate from our point of view if we talk to a physician they are uh, they feel that ethambutol is the safest drug because it actually does not have any systemic uh, real side effects and uh, patients actually do not often tell them uh, about eye related problems and even if they do they are often kind of thought that the uh, patient may be developing a cataract or something and he may eventually go so uh, this has been highlighted um, from our neuro ophthalmology society we've highlighted to the government that it's a key thing and uh, in their nishche app and in their follow up uh, profile of the patients we have asked them to incorporate a vision related question so we have asked them that visual acuity be a baseline examination not necessarily by an ophthalmologist just by a screening chart uh, by the treating physician and one question on visual acuity should be uh, a question that is asked periodically to all patients and they should be made aware that this is a key problem because primary prevention is the only thing that can help us stopping it early and stopping it ambutol is the only real available treatment all the others are more ancillary and just supportive so that is uh, we really are working on we anecdotally expect that uh, uh, the risk is increase will increase although uh, giving credit to the national tb program their uh, weight bands are now actually increasing safety so earlier where the weight bands were not there uh, now they have created very sharp made weight bands which do not allow the which ensure that uh, the weight uh, weight based treatment acting in ethambutol does not is not given at 20 mg per kg more than 20 mg per kg in adults and more than 25 mg per kg in a child so those are key changes but yes the increased duration the fixed doses that are there and of course the uh, the massive roll out of the anti tubercular program although of course important and necessary uh, has in our minds probably created a worry that it may increase toxicity although unfortunately there are not enough uh, you know adequate uh, surveys or evaluation that that will you know lar or give evidence to our suspicion but we have aggressively worked with the government at the ministry of health level to ensure that the key thing is awareness pick up visual loss early so whoever is using uh, giving att or even we are we are going to come out with guidelines we published we are about to publish guidelines in both japi and in igo for both physicians and ophthalmologists on key things including some of the things i have said so this is a cause for concern and i'm i'm very grateful that this has been brought up it is a key worry for us but we hope that uh, with you know adequate uh, awareness we may be able to prevent a, a, a significant increase so one more thing sir along with ethambutol we know as isoniazid can also cause toxic optic neuropathy so if a patient is having visual loss what is the normal uh, protocol you follow whether you stop both the drugs at the same time or you just stop ethambutol observe it for a while and then stop isoniazid like if the vision is still deteriorates uh, absolutely uh, the second point is what we follow and recommend uh, we stop ethambutol immediately and in fact uh, 
even if there is a vision loss, like I showed in a couple of cases where vision loss is not because of ethambutol, maybe because of intracranial tuberculosis or meningitis, we advise stopping ethambutol because optic nerves become more susceptible to damage. And it is difficult to pick up toxic optic neuropathy in a patient who has subnormal vision. So we recommend a stoppage of ethambutol. We follow up the patient. We know that even after stopping ethambutol, visual loss may progress till about a month or so after which it stabilizes. So um, till a month, we do not advise any other intervention except of course what you mentioned as ancillary treatment. But if the second month also, we continue to see visual loss we discussed with the physician, treating physician, to consider stopping uh, INH also. So uh, if there is definite progressive loss and significant so after stopping it, then uh, uh, it should you should think at the next level in stopping INH. Thank you, sir. With this, I think we can conclude our webinar and uh, I would like to thank Dr. Chaveer Singh Bindra for uh, Thanksgiving, a last ceremony of this webinar. All right, ma'am. Ma'am, there's just one uh, question by the audience. The question is, what are the side effects we should expect while starting IV methylprednisolone inhibition? So if you can just answer that question, we can proceed with both of them. So um, essentially, we are looking at uh, uh, electrolyte imbalances and uh, tuberculosis we've talked about. So we had a couple of patients in whom tuberculosis have actually fled up. So you routinely do a chest x-ray to rule out pulmonary cox. And the other thing is was discussed is uh, always give methylprednisolone under observation. So be there or at least there should be some doctor around available. Uh, we generally do baseline electrolytes. But after the second day or third day, you should do a baseline sodium potassium because this electrolytemia can cause severe uh, problems, including death. So essentially, for IV methylprednisolone, uh, uh, under observation, very slow. So it is given you know, an hour or an hour and a half on a slow dose, slow a drop. And uh, of course, baseline electrolytes keep him admitted. It's not necessary to have an ECG constantly running, but... Uh, just have him under observation, slow, slow drug, and uh, rule out tuberculosis if possible. Other than that, I would say that there are no major side effects of just methylpredness. Thank you, sir. Fairly Thank blood you. sugars increase, but they are also, again, very transient. And Thanks in the patient, hypertension. You, and yes, baseline hypertension. Yes, of course. Yeah. Any systemic disease should be uh, checked for you. Yes. Well controlled. Yes. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you all. With this, we come to the end of this webinar on neuroophthalmology. It has been great listening to all the panelists, all the speakers, and it was a, a great conference to see at last. I would like to thank our esteemed panelists and stalwarts, Dr. Rohit Saxena, sir, Dr. Ankur Sena, sir, Dr. Ajit Ramasar, and Dr. Nirin Rai, sir, and our eminent speakers, Dr. P.T. Singh, Dr. Prateek Sharma, Dr. Ganesh Pillay, Dr. Sunil Pandit, sir, Dr. Vivek Som, sir, Dr. Nitin Gurd, sir. I would also like to thank Intode Pharmacuticals, which have been very well coordinated by Mr. Raman and Rahul and his efficient team. Without their support, this wouldn't have been possible. Also, at last but not the least, the most important our audience, which have been there since last I now, I guess, more than two and a half hours and listening to us. Thank you all and hope to have these kind of meetings in future also. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you very thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you to everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rohit. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye, sir. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye, Ganesh. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Rohit, sir. Thank you. Bye, sir. Bye.